Welcome to the OSRS Podcast, where we talk to RuneScape content creators, JMods, and even people who've been to prison for RuneScape-related content. I am Mad Cow, one of the hosts, followed by... What's going on, boys? Rex as always. And hello, it's me, Rice Cup. So today we have a legendary folklore of a man <laughs> by the name of Mr. Josh Pellot. Hello, everybody. Hello. Pleasure yeah. to be here. Should we uh, do the do I... sellout real quick before we uh, get too deep? <laughs> Yeah, for the memes, bro, for the memes. So, uh, I read the comments in the last video, and I don't know if I'll ever read the OSRS podcast comments again, but (laughs) I thought it would probably make a lot of sense that if we were to hit a thousand likes on this video, that we promise to never talk about cryptocurrency again. You guys know you want that. (laughs) Yeah. Better smash that like button right now. Yeah, please. Yeah, we also got uh, another... Sell out thing that we have to fulfill, you know, in 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 replace of Mr. Rixie's uh, beautiful hair not getting cut. So we should have one of those coming up soon. It's has to do with TOB. So yeah. Anyways, how are you doing, Mr. Josh? I'm doing Welcome. well, man. Should I just give the brief rundown real quick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell us a bit about yourself, you know, like um, I'm uh, uh, Josh days. Palal. The Young and Days. That's great. That's a good place yeah. to start because I started yeah. RuneScape in 2004. I was 11 years old. I found it on Mini Clip. I uh, never played any nerdy games, if you will, like that MMORPG style. And it said, uh, you know, collect coins, kill dragons, and complete quests in this massively multiplayer. And I was like, that's just the dopest shit I've ever heard in my entire life. I clicked on it and never looked back. But uh, the reason that I have any degree of notability, whatever I do have, uh, is because in 2012, I got in an argument with an online player when I was 19 <laughs> at the Grand Exchange. I was excessively intoxicated and I threatened to commit a massacre. Um, it was relevant to the argument that we were having. It's not like I just randomly proposed this. Uh, it was pertaining to the argument at hand. I'm not sure exactly what all I should say on what channels, you know, but uh, you can check it out on my channel because I don't care about getting demonetized and all that good stuff. And, and so I don't talk about it on other people's channels, but my channel's got a lot of it. Um, and pretty much the only reason I'm notable for that is because of people like Moplox, Crumb, Silent Core, et cetera, that have done videos about me and about the case. And it was definitely an interesting legal conundrum. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, is this the first ever case of someone going to prison for something like this? Um, I believe that mine was possibly one of the first as far as like ones that received a reasonable amount of attention. But a few months after me, a kid got way, way, way more media attention than I did. His name was Justin Carter, and he said something similar on League of Legends. Um, both of us stated that we were being sarcastic after we said it. Uh, he said, LOL, I'm JK. And I said, it's called sarcasm. That didn't stop the FBI. Uh, his case got a lot more publicity than mine. Uh, last I heard, he was still pending trial, actually. And that's been, he got arrested just a few months after me. And I was in 2012. So uh, he's clearly had a long, drawn out process. But oh to the best of my knowledge, I'm the OG as far as getting arrested for false threats <laughs> on online video games. Yeah. yeah so, we, yeah. Before, Rez. All right. So before, uh, you know, obviously the whole prison stuff, right? Like, what, what, what kind of, what kind of person were you like, right? Like, you, Sounds Before like you were drinking arrested. a bit, you know, you were drinking a bit, right? Like what kind of RuneScape player were you and what was like your mindset, you know, in your life at that point, right? Like you're 19, yeah. that's like a critical point in life, right? You're like, maybe go to college, stuff like that, you know, what's yeah, going absolutely. on? Absolutely. No, great question. Um, I was an absolute degenerate, not in a mean way. Uh, I don't make any attempt to hide this or deny it in any way. I had a very bad, severe history with drugs and alcohol. Um, I didn't have a job at the time of my arrest. Uh, I was really mooching off of people. A bunch of factors that really looked bad when you combine it with, you know, the threats that were said. Uh, when you put all this on paper and take it before a judge, it looks pretty severe. Um, I will say that in my heart of hearts, I always tried to do what I believed was the right thing. I was just very selfish at the time. Uh, my RuneScape gameplay, I didn't know it at the time, but was absolutely mediocre. Even <laughs> with uh, Dungeoneering and Summoning added to the game, my total on my Iron Man now is still higher than it was pre-EOC. Um, luckily I was in jail when EOC came out. Uh, so I missed the drop of it, but, uh, by the time I got out, obviously old school was a thing. Uh, but to be totally honest, man, no, I was not a very good person before I got arrested. You know, I was a, I was a drinker and a drugger and, and all the things that go along with that. But, um, I'm very much a big attitude of positivity and helping people with tips on sobriety, et cetera. Nowadays I've been sober for a long time. I'm 28. I'm married. I have a daughter. Everything's going great now. I made it through it and you can too. And yes, I'm talking to you, whoever you are. You can make it, I promise. Well, congrats on uh, you know the family and all that, honestly. Thanks, man. It's a lot better than it was when I was 19. I was definitely uh, kind of a trashy person. So like I said, 
once the threats came up and then I'll go to a court of law and they got all this stuff, but these factors of my life, you know, I dropped out of high school, et cetera, et cetera. It just looked really bad. I'm not going to lie about it. The case isn't quite as black and white as it might seem from like a, a title or a headline. But uh, at the end of the day, I don't think that anybody possibly could look at my case and believe that I was serious in any capacity. And uh, for anybody who wants further information, I won't refer you even to my channel. I'll refer you to the Crumb documentary about it because he did a phenomenal job. He didn't ask me a single question. He did his own research and it sums it all up there, basically. Yeah, what are you saying? Uh, oh, um, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. My bad. Um, <laughs> no, no, that was great, dude. I, I'm learning a lot here about you. Uh, so do you so apparently you had mediocre gameplay on RuneScape. Did you ever PK? I just gotta ask. I tried. Uh, my first experience with PKing was 2005. Uh, I ran out in the wilderness with a mithril scimitar and a mithril plate body and some lobsters. I was free to play at the time. I PK'd a guy and got another mithril plate body, which somehow mine had taken me forever to save up for. I don't, I don't fucking understand why it took me four weeks to save up for a mithril plate body. But anyways, uh, I got absolutely hooked on it, and I then proceeded to spend the next two months running into the wilderness, losing all of my shit every day because I was twelve. Um, back then, of course, <laughs> PKing was not what it is now. We didn't have the mint mad cows and the frames of the Torvestas back then. You know, we had put your weapon on and hit them. And if I would have had a high enough level of membership, you know, maybe a spec when they, you think they're low health. It was very, very basic at that time. Uh, I tried again in 2012. I didn't know anything about it. There's a YouTube video of it that I'm not going to shout out or tell people about at all where I tried to PK. And I literally only brought ancients. I brought ice barrage. Nothing else. A bunch of rock tail lobsters or whatever the hell they're called on RuneScape 3 and uh, like a brew and barrage. And I thought I was about to get some work done. Uh, I actually got one HP and ring of life out. And now looking back, I'm like, ooh, I wore a ring of life in PvP. That was a bitch move. Oh my God. It worked though. <laughs> yeah, it worked. He didn't get it my worked. arums. He didn't get my arums and my ancient staff. I'll tell you that. He didn't get that. But uh, I, uh, I'm not very familiar with PvP. And let me say this real quick, guys. In my opinion, I know this is totally random for me to throw this in here. Guys, the same thing is happening in politics in America, okay? America right now. If you cannot imagine the mindset of the opposite side, you will be hostile towards them. You will be aggressive towards them, and it will cause nothing but division and anger. PKers and, and PVMers, guys, we got to see both sides of this here. They're having fun. PKers are players, too. Give them their damn updates. Quit crying about it as part of the game. I'm sorry. And that's coming from an Iron Man. I personally yeah. am not much into PKing, but, bro, if I'm killing Callisto, I'm fair game. It aggravates me. It's an inconvenience, and I'm not risking anything, but, damn it, it's your right to do it. So I just hope Amen. that everybody goes, you know what? They're still players of our game. I love I love this game. I want it to thrive. I want PKers to play the game. I want the longevity here. We all got to get along, guys. We got to find some compromise here. Even if it's some updates that make it easier for PKers, which is not great. Great PvP design in my mind. It's still something. Give PvP or P, give give the PvP community updates. Sorry about that. I had to go on my little rant there because the yeah. the, the hostility and the hatred is absurd right now. Hey, I will never stop here. a rant like that. All right. That was <laughs> beautiful, dude. I always find it weird that the RuneScape community is so divided, even though we play the the same hipsterish JavaScript point to click ass game. That's so what we're saying, bro. We fighting. don't have the numbers to be fighting amongst ourselves right now, man. Sense. We're in a crisis. <laughs> this is a crisis right now. You can't be this divided, you know? Um, oh, hell, I was going to say something else about it. I just hope that. that PVM and PKers, man, look, it's a part of the game. And I, I understand. I had a friend put it to me like this, and it, and it made sense to me because people always say, you know, don't go in the wilderness if you don't want to die. The guy said, does that mean if I go kill Corp at the core player, I should expect to get crashed because you can, because that's what it's for? I mean, the lair is for killing Corp, right? So if somebody else comes in and starts doing it, the fact of the matter is it's a dick move. And I said, they're having fun, bro. Look, the Corp crashers, they're doing that shit for – Personal profit. I mean, I guess PKers are too. Most of what they're doing is just for fun. It's a lot less malicious. Um, I personally haven't been, you know, told to sit by any PKers in the wilderness. And I trash talk when a PKer attacks me. I do. I'm not going to lie about it. I call them names all the way up and down. I call them thirsty. I call them sweaty. I'm going to call them all that. I'm way more toxic towards the PKers than they are towards me. That's a personal issue. And I take responsibility for that. But at the end of the day, guys, it's allowed. I hate that I got to go in there for my dragon pickaxe, but I'm going to do it. And if I get attacked, you know what? Good luck, bro. I got bruised and I got my combo eats and I'm ready to go. And you got a big I, mouth. <laughs> I can't and I got, believe. And I got fast fingers. I can't believe you trash talk, dude. I would have never expected it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you'd be surprised how much I get that, man. Especially if I'm like sarcastically being toxic on stream. I went to grab an eclectic gimpling at Castle Wars a few weeks ago. Iron, by the way, obviously. I got to go grab it. I don't have ranger boots yet. 
And uh, some other iron ran up and grabbed it. And I said, you motherfucker. And he says, LOL. <laughs> Snape grass. And I was like, you deserve it. And they're all like, Josh, man, Josh, man, that was toxic. And I told him, I said, bro, I'm sorry. I was just kidding. You got there first. That was fair play. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, I just, my, my play style is I play Iron Man now. I'm shitty at it. I'm 2K total. I'm working on it. I just started top and stuff like that. Um, but man, like I said, guys, I'm sorry to get sidetracked, but it's part of the game. Nah, y'all. We're going to get good. attacked. We're going to get attacked. It's going to happen. I hate having to go in the wilderness for the dragon pig. Oh, what I was going to say, I know where the legality line is now. That's the important part to my trash talk. I still talk mad trash, but I'm <laughs> fully aware of where that line in the sand is where the American government says, stop. Yeah, you you know cannot say more than this. <laughs> you know it best, bro. Oh, I studied it. Yes, I know exactly where that line is. I'm aware that you can say conditional statements. You are completely allowed to say, if somebody blows up the moon, I'm going to shoot the president. That's a protected statement. Why? Because it's conditional. You said, F this, then that. That's conditional. That's legally protected. What I said was not. Not even close oh to legally God, protected. Man. Yeah, I'll take a note from that, all right? Yeah, what the? So Keep that in if, mind. We, if we go back to the prison talk then, so it, you were 19 at the time when you made these threats. Is yep. that correct? Absolutely. And um, like, talk us through the process. So obviously you sent these messages, a player reported you in game. And mm -hmm. then like, how long were we talking before, the, you know, the police get involved? Was it the police? Was it the FBI? Like what, what was the whole thing that happened after that? And how long did it take? Okay, so I got raided four days after I made the threats. Um, as far as the process yeah. that went on behind the scenes, the, the FBI became aware of this situation less than an hour after I said it. Okay, but it wow. took them four days to secure the warrants, to get the team together, and to come kick my door in. They didn't actually have to kick my door in. They were about to, but I opened the door just in time. Uh, metaphorically kick my door in. Um, yes, I got into this argument with this player. Um, it, the, the, it started because a player told me to download a game that made fun of a massacre that did happen in 1999. I told him no. Another player saw the name of the massacre and came over and just attacked me. He said, you're a dumbass. Don't talk about that. You're fucking stupid, man. And and so I just was drunk and I said, I'm going to do it. Ha, ha, ha. He reported me to Jagex. Jagex received the threat with absolutely no context, no other information at all. And they did what, and that good God, how much flack did they get for this from everybody but me? They did the only reasonable option and reported it to the local police. I just found this out a month ago. They didn't call the FBI. They called the local police. Oh, They're yeah. the ones that called the oh. FBI. And Jagex is supposed to call the FBI because it's a different country. <clears throat> um, so uh, AJ Mod, I know his name and all that. He um, sent the threats to the FBI or to the police. The police sent it to the FBI. They secured a warrant. Four days later, they came and got me uh, with transmitting threats to kill and injure the person of another and transmitting threats to destroy buildings by means of fire and explosives, which in my opinion, I didn't technically do, but the law is broad. So it was about four days from the time. Uh, I made the threats October 4th of 2012. I woke up October 5th and I was permanently muted. Logged on to a free-to-play pure account that I had um, and gave my main account away to somebody and I started playing World of Warcraft and that's what I was doing when they showed up a few days later. Unfortunately, I was also listening to Rage Against the Machine and that's probably why I got so much time. <laughs> oh, no. the, the machine that's... showed up at my house while I was playing Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> so, Man. Jesus, like when they turned up, like were you ex like were you just like what the hell's going on, or did you mm -hmm. have like an inkling it was about the RuneScape stuff? I had no clue. Uh, that's a very good question, man. I don't get asked that a lot. I was so drunk at the time that I said this, I barely remembered the entire situation. I remembered somebody fucking with me, me fucking with them, and I remember thinking that I had said something really offensive. But on my permanent mute that I had the next day, my report said, I can't wait to blow brains out of skulls. And yes, I know that's a little bit graphic. I was drunk, and I'm not going to pretend I didn't go hard on this troll. Uh, that's why I went to prison for it. But um, so I didn't have anything other than that to go off of other than I can't wait to blow brains out of skulls. And I was like, I know I threatened somebody, but I will say when I opened that door and I had all those guns in my face that no RuneScape was on my mind at all. It never yeah, crossed no. my mind that these threats oh, could no be way. it. They asked me if I knew why they were there. And my best guess was that I smoked a lot of weed at the time. And I said, do my neighbors think I'm growing weed? And this is the response because they had dogs out there. I didn't know this at the time, but they have bomb sniffing dogs. I thought that all dogs were drug dogs. They have dogs that smoke gasoline, gunpowder, et cetera, et cetera, you know, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so they had a bunch of dogs and, and you know, all these guns and field agents, and they were on my roof climbing up the house and shit and had the whole house surrounded, the neighborhood blocked off, barricaded. I don't know how the hell we didn't notice this happening, uh, especially with a tin roof. And but no, man, I can tell you that RuneScape was the farthest thing from my mind at the time. I had no clue that something I said on RuneScape would have been the reason for my arrest. Jesus. That, that, that's just... 
I, I'm kind of surprised that you actually went to prison for frets. Like, you probably know a lot more about this than I do, but it's like, obviously, if they did go to your house, they had the uh, bomb-sniffing dogs and stuff. It's like, if they didn't find any evidence that you were actually going to go through with it, like, what mm -hmm. is it they arrested you under? Like, was it just for making a fret? Is that is that what it was? Yep, it is against the law. Uh, America, we, you know, we got First Amendment, which is the right to freedom of speech. Uh, that has limits. Everybody sees my case and they scream, LOL, First Amendment. It doesn't work like that. True threats. Thing, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Words that may be constituted as a true threat by a third party are not protected by the First Amendment. That's why you can't yell bomb on an airplane or fire in a movie theater. You know what I'm saying? Because somebody can take that as danger to their lives. That is not protected. You're not allowed to give people anxiety for no fucking reason, basically. Um the, so yes, what I actually served time for was literally transmitting threats to destroy buildings by means of fire and explosives. That's the count that I pled out to. I did have to plead guilty because the way the law was written at the time, which has since changed and I would not go to prison for the same thing today, there now has to be proof of criminal intent at the onset of the threat. They have to get in there and prove either that I was trying to cause mass panic or that I was really going to do it. Either one of those criteria, you're fucked. But as long as they go there, they're probably going to prosecute you, give you some probation, but you're not going to go to prison for it. It is also worth noting that, as you said, nothing was found in my house. No guns, no drawings, no bombs, not a BB gun, not a pocket knife. I had literally nothing dangerous at all, except for some illicit substances in the drawer by my bed. That's the most dangerous thing in the whole house. Jesus. Right, real, yeah, real, real question, though. And honestly, like this, you know, like there's I think it's just really important to to, to really get this off. Right. Like. When you obviously, you know, did your time and all that stuff, right? Like, do you do you feel like it was unfair that you took you did how much time? Like it was several years, right? Yeah, I served six years total. Yeah, did you think did you think it was fair that you went to prison for six years just over saying these things? Like obviously saying these things is absolutely wrong, right? Absolutely. And and mm -hmm. in today's uh, new ruling, it would it would not get you in into six years or anything close right but like yep. really do you do, do you feel like that was a was a bit too much in your opinion i will admit that yes uh my entire perspective on my case people think that i'm out here saying i did nothing wrong that's not my point and it never has been my point is that the sentence was excessive that the american government went completely insane because they tried their hardest to prove that i was serious instead of saying we checked it out we did our job we're glad kid you're getting a slap on the wrist and some probation you know, they went insane. I mean, they, they, they because my case got a lot of publicity, they were looking like assholes. During my time in jail, it was 17 months from my arrest to my sentencing. 17 months I was in there. During that 17 months, according to Crum, there were over 40 mass shootings in America. They had a point to prove, man. I became a scapegoat for something that is way bigger than me I, as just this 19-year-old stoner drinker kid that likes to skateboard and play guitar. You know, this was something a net far bigger and it's funny to me because in retrospect, man, this was never something I ever imagined that I would be like semi wannabe fake activist about. But the American incarceration problem is absurd. We have one thirty third of the world's population and one fourth of the world's prison population. But that's a topic for another day. I spent two years in there writhing rice cup. I spent two years in there steaming about it. And I was doing drugs in prison and, and mad at the world. And, and like just I, it was eating me. It was eating me because there were lies that were told in my case by people that I knew. This whole agenda came together um, and, and it was just absurd to me, you know, that, that at this age that I would get this much time from a judge who is very well known as a fair judge, might I add. He is a very, very good judge. And I have to admit that for cases other than mine, he is well respected. He's known as a, as a compassionate guy. Um, yeah, man, it definitely felt unfair. It felt excessive. And in retrospect, it still does to me. I don't regret the fact that I had to serve six years now. I'm married. Somehow I managed to get a living on Twitch, twitch.tv slash jpalalt. I know it's a doozy, but you can see the spelling somewhere around here, guys. Um, Link in the description. <laughs> thank you. Link in the description. Right down there, guys. Um, it's, it's the reason that I am who I am today. I wouldn't have met my wife if I wouldn't have been at the halfway house at the exact time. I even got in trouble in prison, which moved my date of release back 52 days. Had that not happened, I would have never met my wife. Like Now I've got a beautiful baby girl, man. I'm somehow managing to keep the lights on and keep us fed from Twitch playing a game that I still love with a complete and full passion. Um, it was my path, man. And it, it sometimes, sometimes our paths suck. And I'm not trying to get all hippy dippy or spiritual on anybody, man. But sometimes our paths suck. But the way that I see it is what doesn't kill you, make you stronger. It's a cliche for a reason. 
And uh, you're going to be a better person at the end of it, man. Someday all the terrible shit that happens to you is just going to be a bad memory. Sometimes I can't believe I did that long in prison. You know what I mean? That's it's crazy. still unfair. At the end of the day, yeah. it's unfair. I agree. It's unfair. I shouldn't have done six years for that. Punishment was deserved. People think I'm not saying that. Intervention and punishment was absolutely warranted in my case. Six years was fucking too much, man. That's my only position on it. Dude, mm. like, it just seems so crazy that you would spend six years of your life behind bars for making effectively an empty fret with no proof to, like... Like, there's, like, no proof that you were actually planning to do anything at all. But, like, maybe maybe your case is the reason why they've changed that now and you can't quite just go to prison for saying that kind of thing. I don't know. But, do you know, it's funny. Before this podcast, I was just telling these two that um, when I was young, I did something incredibly stupid on RuneScape as well. And um, <clears throat> I hope this doesn't piss you off telling you this. But basically... I was muted. This is back, God, it must have been in the early 2000s. So I, I was like, you know, really young. I was probably, I don't know, like 14, maybe 15 at a push. I got muted in game and um, I was really annoyed. And uh, I at the time, you could put in like a request to be unmuted or unbanned or whatever it was. I remember those. And you could type freely. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I typed in a request and, uh, you know, I was the same when I was younger. I was very edgy bit of an asshole to be honest with you and it was like a darker time mm -hmm. so i thought it'd be funny to just write in some bullshit and there was like it was a quote i think from a film and i can't remember what film it was but i effectively like i typed to jagex saying if you guys don't unmute me i'm coming i'm coming to jagex hq and i'm gonna pump you full of lead like i literally typed Ooh. that and you know what the crazy thing is they unmuted me straight up <laughs> yeah so my, my my mute got taken off and then like a day later i got another message directly from jagex i can't remember who it was but they basically just said like you know we don't tolerate this kind of stuff and i i can't really remember what they said exactly um but yeah like i said something really stupid when i was super young and um I got unmuted for it, but I never spent any time in prison. I never had anything past that email from them. <laughs> yep. It's crazy. Like it, it's, it's, it's kind of nuts to think about really. See the way that I probably, I personally view that. No, it absolutely doesn't piss me off at all. I believe that this is Jagex handling things in a way that's appropriate. In this case, it dealt with them and their building and themselves, you know, and they probably felt like, okay, this is probably fake. We can handle this or whatever. But when it's dealing with third parties, especially all the way across the ocean where I am, they have absolutely no clue. As to the credibility, you know, um, I would like to reiterate real quick that Jagex got subpoenaed to come testify on my court case and they told him, hell no. Jagex was asked questions about my case in the lingo of the game and they said, we don't want anything to do with this. A lot of people tell me that Jagex owes me an apology. I'm friends with J Mods, y'all. The J Mods that have been on this podcast are friends of mine, you know. Uh, I tweet at Mod Ash all the time. I just tell them, have a good day. You know, you can count yourself as a friend of Mod Ash if you've ever tweeted at him. Um, sure. Jagex, man, they had no choice but to do what they did, and I'm not upset with them at all. The, the, what they did was absolutely appropriate. It was the only option that they had. It was perfect, in my opinion. It's the American government and the FBI and the overzealous prosecution system that led to my demise. So just so nobody in the comments is all like, oh, my God, Jagex, oh, they should apologize and give them free membership for life. They had no choice. I left their hands tied, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, It, it was I mean, pretty much America. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. America got yeah. me. Um. So you alluded to a lot of like pretty dark themes, you know, like the whole, um, you know, for, for profit prisons and like, you know, how all those things kind of lead to incentives for people to get arrested and stuff like that, you know, but that's not mm -hmm. necessarily what you got arrested for. But but like, you but know, you, you were definitely, you know, kind of got caught in this whole big scheme of, you know, the system of ours. Right. There is definitely mm -hmm. a lot of dark stuff that we can't really go deep on. But like, you know. You know that you weren't fairly, uh, you know, arrested and then sent to prison for six years. And you said for a year and a few months, you were just absolutely like you were just Miserable. absolutely annoyed uh, by mm -hmm. everything. Right. So what what kind of made you what, what changed? You know, what like what happened or, or what inspired you to be like, you know what? There's there's a better way to look at things, you know, like what's yeah. like what's happens yeah. happened. How do you move on? Like what caused that, you know? That's like an excellent question, point. man. Um, this is going to sound probably super corny to a lot of people, and I'm no longer a practicing Buddhist, <laughs> but I found Buddhism. 
I found a book about it. It was absolutely beautiful to me. It was very consistent with the way that I felt that I truly was and the real me, not the me that's got this fake, you know, I just want drugs and this, this jaded persona. It really hit me to the core. And there were just all these articles about how like, like everything in life is a lesson if you let it be. If you are aware enough and intelligent enough, everything is a lesson at the end of the day. It might not be a lesson you want, but it's one that you need or else it wouldn't have happened. It's basically Buddhism's stance on it. Um, and there was a huge article about overcoming, you know, adversity. And I just kind of had this epiphany where I was like, dude, I'm sitting here feeling sorry for myself for some dumb shit that I did. First off, uh, yeah, they got me, but I let them get me first. You know, they couldn't have got me if I didn't make my mistake in the first place. This is crazy. But at the end of the day, these dudes are trying to ruin my life. They're, I'm a convicted felon now. I'm still a convicted felon. As, as it stands now, I will be a felon for the rest of my life. If I go within 100 yards of a gun, mandatory minimum, five years in prison. I can't go to prison for less than five years if I'm caught anywhere near a gun. It's insane. It, the law is written really broad. Like It's like if, if you drive past a police car, I could go to prison for it because he had a gun. <laughs> you know, it's like that broad. But um, man, one day I legitimately decided in my prison cell, and I think I was high at the time. I'm not going to lie about it. Um, I was like, you know what? Fuck what they think, man. Fuck what they say. Fuck what they're trying to do to me. Nobody and nothing's going to hold me back anymore. I was holding me back on the street. I was the kind of guy that wanted to lay in bed and get drunk and blame everybody else for my problems while my life was going badly. When I wasn't going out there putting in job applications, I wasn't out there trying to make myself better, applying to schools. I had absolutely no, I was just treading water basically, man. And I decided, I said, you know what? I'm the one who put myself here. I'm the one who made me a drug addict. I'm the one that dropped out. All this stuff is shit that I did, but I can fix it. I'm still alive. It's not too late. Nothing and nobody's going to hold me back anymore. Whenever I get out of here, I'm going to do phenomenal. I'm going to stay sober. I'm going to try to meet a good girl. Uh, I'm going to play RuneScape and, and maybe an education and get a good job. Like I had, you know, I just kind of had this epiphany. Unfortunately, the first time that I was released from prison, I didn't work out like that because I went buck wild and I went right back to prison for another year. But um, man, I legitimately had just an epiphany moment where I decided that nothing anybody said was going to define me. I wasn't going to let this felony stop me. I wasn't going to let prison stop me. It was in my hands, you know, and I know that so much of what I'm saying sounds like the most cliche nonsense to people that they probably can't buy into. But cliches are often for a reason, you know. Agreed. Agreed. No, it's so you, powerful, okay. man. It's powerful, dude. I mean, like, you know, I, I hear a lot of stuff about people that go to prison, and I, I'd like to ask, you know, what was your experience like in there? Like, you know, I imagine your inmates, the people that you made friends with or maybe were enemies with, like, what did they think about the whole thing? Because at this point in time, I, I imagine a lot of people in there, firstly, some of them probably didn't even know what the internet was because it was mm -hmm. so early on. And like, secondly, they're probably like, how the fuck did you get six years for making a fret on the internet? Like, how does that work? So how, how did they treat you? What did they think of you? And how, how was your time with the inmates when you were there? For sure. That's a great question, man. Um, a lot of people naturally assume that me having been a RuneScape player and kind of a, you know, a nerdy bookish guy, if you will, despite the fact that I have no education, uh, would have had a really rough time in there. But in my opinion, and I feel like a lot of ex-convicts could agree with this, there's kind of roles in prison, you know? You got, like, pretty much everybody in there is going to fall under four or five umbrellas, you know? First, you're going to divide by race because everybody has to divide by race in there, obviously. But after that, you got, like, the guys that are the gangster drug dealers, you know? The crazy violent guys. Then you got, you know, uh, the guys that are just doing their time, the independents that stay out of the way and just want to read books and watch TV and they're not trying to do drugs or fight or anything like that. They have a sentence they have to serve. Um, there's just these broad categories sort of, and I fell under the musician category because I ended up playing guitar for about seven hours a day, uh, for years on end because it was just my release and my escape. And I studied music theory and really, really became just absolutely best friends with a guitar out there on the rec yard. You could go to the rec yard, turn in your prison ID and check out a guitar. Uh, the idea is to make sure you don't steal strings from it <laughs> for tattoos. Um, yeah. So my role was the funny guy. I like to shoot the shit. I like to be sarcastic. I like to joke around, you know. Nobody takes me seriously. They don't think that I have a big ego because in prison, two dudes thinking that you have a uh, you have a building that has a thousand men in it and every single one of them is the toughest motherfucker there. It's amazing. You know what I mean? Like, so there's all these ego clashes and I just went in with no ego. In county jail, I had ego. When I got there when I was 19, I acted like all 19 year olds do in jail. I, you know, somebody like, hey man, are you going to eat that? Yeah, hell yeah, I'm going to eat that. Why are you asking me that? Luckily for me, my drug doing crazy street running life that was totally separate from my RuneScape life kind of prepared me for it. I was street smart. I had I wasn't scared to fight when I was in high school. And I don't even like saying that because people think I have a big ego or something like that. Everybody gets their ass kicked every now and then. All right. It's part of it. 
Um, but I went in there with no ego, man. I had a good time. I hung out with black guys. I hung out with white guys. I hung out with Hispanic guys. I learned how to speak semi-fluent Spanish just hanging out with Mexican dudes in prison, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So by not associating myself with one particular group, I didn't have any issues with the other groups. And I kept my head down and I did my time, man. I did not join a gang. I'm not trying to sit here and be like, yeah, bro, you know, repping my set. I was holding it down. That's not me. I'm not some big tough guy. Um, the prisons that I went to were violent. They, they were medium high securities. I was the top threat level for my charge. My age group, my crime, and the fact that I dropped out of high school, I almost went to one of the extremely violent prisons called USPs, United States Penitentiaries, the high level, but I went to a medium high. And obviously you got to fight, man. I mean, I had my scraps. I won some, I lost some. If somebody says something disrespectful or tries you or whatever, I mean, you have to, there's just no choice. And you're not going to die. If anybody here ever goes to jail or prison, bro, they're not going to kill you. Not you have to owe them 50 grand, man. You can handle a punch in the face. It's not that fucking bad. So you stand up for yourself, man, or else they're going to they're going to take advantage of you. They're going to try to take your shit. Don't be scared. They don't care in there if you win or lose your fight. They care that you fought. You know what I mean? Don't mm. don't brew up and run away. He's stand speaking there. to you, Ree. <laughs> uh, no, nah, I'll be like, yo, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> let's just, hey, 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 let's just talk this out. Hey, hey. Send them a trade request yeah, and give them a couple GP, story. you know. <laughs> <laughs> luckily, luckily, I knew my way around the Dragon Dagger, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I uh, look, came I in there with fight. the DDS. I, I used to fight myself when I was younger, okay? So, uh, you know, so I'm the real village practice. life, you know, the village life, dude. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Rice used to live in a village, and apparently, uh, well, Rice, yeah. you want to talk a little bit about your village experience, Steve, since we're talking about fighting? Wait, you legitimately lived in a village? Yeah, for yeah, you? yeah. I'm, yeah, I live, I, well, you know, I'm an immigrant, you know, I'm a fob, fresh off the boat, you know? But yeah, I mean, it doesn't really pertain to this, but yeah, when I was younger, you know, I lived in the village and, uh, you know, fighting and stuff is kind of normal just because, you know, kids, they talk stuff, they talk shit, they might spit on your face, you know, and you, you got to be like, yo, what the hell, you know, you get, and then mm -hmm. you got to fight back. So, and then you get caught because then people snitch on you and then you get beat up by your parents because they're like, yo, you can't do that, you know, and then you, you just get your lashes. I'm like, oh, God damn it. You're a first generation immigrant, man. No, I'm, I'm like a second. I'm second. Oh, okay. But yeah. you were still raised and that's awesome man yeah 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 mm -hmm. you must have come here really young your english is flawless oh yeah yeah probably <laughs> when i was like eight or something you know uh, that's eight impressive man I, I met dudes in there that lived in america for 20 years and they still had terrible accents couldn't hardly talk yeah um, thank, thank decent education and phonics you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> we don't have much of that in america just kidding just kidding guys some places so, do Dude, um, I also meant to answer Rakesy's question that I got along fine with everybody, man. I, I stayed out of the way. I was known as the guy who will joke around with you. People that I, when I was doing drugs in prison, people, if they had a good amount of drugs, they wanted to come do drugs with me. You know, this dude's fucking funny. Let's sit in the cell, get high with him, man. He's going to sit there and just shoot the shit and he won't shut up. And we can just sit there like, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> so, you know, I, I did all right, man. I, I didn't have any problems with anybody. I just tried to keep it cool, keep it funny, you know, and I went to band practice six days a week. I was in like four or five different bands because uh, musicians were limited. And I will admit that I was better than the other guitarists there. So everybody invited me into their band. And I filled my days up, man. You know, you get into your no. routine. And before you know it, holy shit, it's been yeah. six months. Holy shit. I remember the day that I was 19 months to the day from getting out, man. 19 months left. And I was so excited. I was like, I'm in the teens. I'm in the <laughs> teens. We can do this. I've got 19 months left to the day, man. I'm going to get out of this bitch. 19 months. This is awesome. And it, it's crazy. It's really mostly a story, and, and we'll get back to you know the group conversation here, but it's really mostly a story, in my opinion. Prison is all about a salt grain of hope can get you through anything, man. It gets humans through the worst, most devastating, horrific experiences in life, and that one little grain of salt of hope will keep a motherfucker alive and keep you going, and you, know, you just got to get into your routine, man. Dude, if I can add to that real quick then, so with the whole hope aspect... Um, I, I don't know if you had people who were doing like life sentences at your prison, but what about people that have no hope and it's like they will spend the rest of their lives there? Like, did you encounter any people like that? And like, how were they? It, it actually comes back to the same thing. Yes, I had cellmates that were serving life sentences. I was surrounded by lifers, you know. They still have hope. Realistically, zero. Inside of their heart, inside of their belief system, that little salt grain is getting them through it. Uh, I was actually... Fairly good friends with a very, very, very famous uh, drug dealer, Kingpin, uh, known as the Black Hand of Death. I don't have any problem shouting him out. He's my boy, uh, Clarence Heatley. And let me tell you, he's doing life plus 255 years or something like that. Um, he allegedly, I don't think they proved it, kidnapped Bobby Brown. And Whitney Houston paid his ransom directly into this guy's hand. Uh, he's a full-fledged gangster, and he's not getting out of there. He's not, man. I love the guy. He's funny as shit. He's got one of the darkest senses of humor now that I've ever met. But for... 
20 years now, he, he legitimately has a pair of shower slides that he wears to the shower older than me. He's been in there since like 91 or 90, wow. and I was born in 92. He's got shower slides that are cracked and repaired up in a, in a robe for when they used to sell robes in the feds from like God. fucking 1996. He's still got shit in there from when I was just a baby, you know? And that the man wakes edition. up every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the limited edition. They don't sell them there anymore, so it really is. Somebody would give him like $400 for that robe in there. I'm not kidding. If you can't get it, if it's exclusive in prison, motherfuckers will pay you anything. I mean, it's, it's like similar to Rares and RuneScape, you know what I mean? When you're the only one that's got it, it's whatever price you want. Even if it's useless, third age pickaxe, we're looking at you. Um, this dude wakes up every morning, man, and we're not allowed to have irons. We have a press iron, you know, for dudes going to visitation. That dude gets up every morning, man. He goes out there, he presses his clothes, gets some crisp, puts the creases in it, sprays his little potato water on it for starch. He has to steal potatoes from the kitchen, mix it in a bottle, he sprays it for the starch. Uh, he's a he's a custodian there. You know, he has his prison job is to clean. He mops the floors and he sings the Chicago blues and he waits for the day that one of his appeals works, you know? The dude's got lawyers attacking it. He's hiring jailhouse lawyers. He's looking at every possible angle. And in his heart, somewhere, he still believes he's going to see the sunset again one day, man. And it's like simultaneously like a beautiful and a horrible thing. You know what I mean? Because the, realistically, there's no possible way. I, I tried to help him with his case. I looked it up. Dude, you did it. You're done. You know what I mean? If you overdose on heroin between like 1986 to 1991, he bought it and sold it to you. Maybe 100 people up, but he did it. You know, like... Bro, Damn. you're doing life, man. You're doing life. You did it. You got caught. You knew the risk, you know, but he believes in his heart that he's getting out, man. And sometimes there's prison reform that is quite relevant to lifers. They recently uh, changed the law for automatic life sentences, wherein uh, third strike, it's basically third strike drugs, automatic life sentence. They, they changed that uh, in 2015 to mandatory minimum 30 years. So it's still pretty bad. But if they make that retroactive, like they say, and this now applies to all cases from the past that were affected by this law, then they actually have a shot. If they've done more than 30 years and they have a shot now, you know, and it's shit like that. That's why they wake up every day, because if this law becomes retroactive, which it very well could in the next four years, we, we'll see. Um, it, it was a great bill. It was phenomenal. And it's helping unclog the prison system. You know, executive clemency happened and they let a ton of prisoners out. Uh, that's a bunch of shit that I just happen to know about because I was there. I'm not going to blab about it, but uh, mm -hmm. that's what gets them through it. That's what gets them through it, man. That tiny grain of hope, even when it's hopeless. I guess I should have emphasized on that. It was intelligent of you to pick up on that and, and you know, find a loophole there. That's the part of it, is that even when there is no realistic hope, that little tiny grain of false hope gets them up every day, man. That dude's been getting up, mopping the floors and ironing a shirt since before I was fucking born in the same room, in the same building, with just a rotating cast of faces. It's absurd, man. But I'm not, I'm not going to wow. deny his sentence. He deserved it, bro. That's a life, mm -hmm. a life bid for sure. It's crazy. That, is, that is some crazy willpower right there. It is, man. Uh, it, it's amazing. Now, you were saying that you got out of prison and then you went back in. Could you instantly. tell me a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah, instantly. I think I was on the street for about it. maybe 40 days, I think. It was less than two months. It was less than a month and a half. I think I was out for maybe 40 days. Uh, yeah, so I got home. First, they gave me an ankle bracelet, uh, which is where I... Um, that's where I got home, home house arrest from the halfway house. I got released to a halfway house, which is a place where you can go to work, but you got to come back and sleep here. You got to take drug tests and breathalyzers. It's a very, very effective tool for helping inmates because you kick an inmate straight out to the street. They're going to fuck up. But halfway houses are a great transition, man. They help you save up some money. They'll take you to get your driver's license and your social security card. They'll help you look for apartments. You know what I mean? It's, it's awesome, man. They're great people where I was at uh, Dismas in, in Tupelo, Mississippi. Um, so I got there. Shit was dope. I broke the rules instantly because one week after I got there, Silent Core contacted me. Shout out to Silent Core. Dan, if you ever watch this, I fucking love you. You're the reason that I'm feeding my family right now, bro. Thank you for starting everything. But anyways, um, he did a video interview with me or uh, a Discord call. And I'm sitting here going, the fuck is Discord? What, what is this? How do I join? And he's like, hang on. Hang on. I'm going to call you. And you just push answer. And I'm like, I'm fucking this up. My phone's going to explode. <laughs> I'd never had, I never had a touch screen before I went to prison. So I got out in 2017. I had my first Yo, touch you're screen. You're like a caveman, you know? Exactly. You yeah, for real. I was like a grandpa. People still call me a grandpa because I don't fuck with that snap gram and Insta chat and all that stuff. I don't know anything about that. I wasn't there for the rise of it. Instagram was a thing, but we used to say, how much does a hipster weigh in Instagram? Because it was so, that. yeah, it was so <laughs> unpopular. Like it was only for fucking hipsters. Um, oh, now's blowing up oh, yeah now it's the the most probably the most popular fucking format but back yeah. then we made fun of it um funny so i got to the halfway house that was chill i did the phone call with dan we talked for 30 minutes he made a video out of it i instantly got written up fbi got pissed they're calling they're trying to send me back to prison because you're technically not allowed to do media interviews 
The owner of the halfway house loopholed it and said, this was not media. This was social media, YouTube. He did not do it himself. He didn't upload the video. She saved my ass. She's a wonderful woman. And everybody complains about her. It's just like the J mods. They're doing their best trying to help people and make mm. this shit better. And everybody just complains about it. Same thing at the halfway house. Um, so at the halfway house, I was doing good until uh, a friend of mine had some Suboxone. And I used to, uh, which is an anti, you know, to help you get off of opiate addiction. It's a medicine. But if you're not addicted to opium, it makes you feel like you're on it. Like opiates, I mean. It's very, you know, naughty opiate type. Um, so I did that. And I have a drug problem. So once I did that, the door was open. I'm not going to lie about it. People know it. I have a drug problem. I've been clean for years now. Don't get me wrong, but it's still active. It's waiting on me. Um, don't touch it again. You know. Oh, I'm not. I've got way yeah. too much to lose now, man. Everything is built <laughs> on the foundation of my sobriety. I got my just for today bracelet on. I've been wearing it for years since I got out of forced rehab for, the, for uh, my probation. Uh, halfway house went smooth. They gave me an ankle bracelet. I worked a job. It was a shitty job that I was working uh, the first time around. I was working at Sonic. You know, making all right money, but I was going home to my mom's house in the same hometown where I got arrested with all the same people that I grew up with, with all the same people that I was doing drugs with, uh, with oh. no change whatsoever and confused as fuck and having anxiety for the first time in my life. I'd never had anxiety before. I thought it was bullshit. I thought it was something pussy said to make an excuse, you know, and forgive me for even saying that y'all because I've now experienced it. Every time a car drove past my mom's house, I had a fucking panic attack. I thought the FBI was there to get me. And uh, I was running around the room like, oh, my God, oh, my God, like I couldn't sleep and I couldn't sit down. I've never had that happen before. And everybody's telling me to make a Snapgram. Everybody's telling me to make Instachat. Everybody's telling me you got to be a Twitch streamer. Dan's the reason I made my Twitch account. I didn't even know what the fuck Twitch was, but he said I should make one. And now that's what I do for a living. Uh, thank you. Shout out to the Strong Squad. And, um, dude, I did what I knew best immediately. You know, I, I got on Facebook when I got home and I started having a craving because I know a real good way to calm down all that anxiety and all that brain burning when you're freaking out, you know, unfortunately I turned to what I knew best, man, instead of seeking external alternatives or internal rather. Um, and I texted my old friends and before you know it, I was badly hooked on alcohol again, drinking a fifth of hundred proof vodka a day secretly with nobody knowing, hiding it from my mom. Uh, and the PO showed up at my house and it is what it is. You know, it was my, it was my third strike. I failed two drug tests before that. Uh, or no, I admitted to one. I got away with drinking, went to rehab, Tried really hard to get sober and embrace the honesty that comes with that. Confessed to my PO that I had drank and got away with it, and the motherfucker striked me. So oh. the next time that I failed the test, it was over with. My PO texted me uh, the next day, and he said, I need you to come to the federal building at 9 o'clock a.m. on Friday. And I was like, oh, he ain't never told me a time before. I'm hit. So I get there, go up the yeah. elevator. As soon as I step off the elevator, you're Josh, right? The marshals got me, slapped the cuffs on me, and I went right back. Same judge that hates my guts. I've got a video coming out soon for this judge. My next video on YouTube is uh, an open letter to my judge. So be sure to come check that out. Uh, the same judge that sentenced me, who had just sentenced a guy that got caught with meth and needles, ran from the cops, crashed his car, had not called his PO in a month. He gave that guy six months. I smoked some weed and drank some beer. And he gave me a year force followed by mandatory six months halfway house. So... Uh, wow. To say that he's biased is an understatement. Yeah, he's biased. He's biased. He hates oh, me. 100%. I was a dick. I took the stand during my sentencing hearing. I don't know if I mentioned that, you guys. And I need a haircut right now because I'm older. But at the time, my hair looked like this. And I got on the stand. And they're trying to, you know, you did this and you said this. And they're acting all serious. And I'm over here like, you guys are old, man. You know what I mean? Like, I had the worst <laughs> attitude, dude. I was such a cocky little shit. My uh, <laughs> maximum recommended sentence was two years, right? There's a guideline range. Crimes have points which correlate to a chart that dictates the recommended sentences for your crime. Who made With that? a six-point enhancement for intent, theoretically, it's actually not bad. It's actually reasonable guidelines. I will say that. It's just that they don't have to stick to them. They're advisory. And that's where we get the fuck-ups um, because it's not, it's not forced. You have statutory maximums. The guideline may say, okay, we recommend a maximum two-year, but the crime carries 10. You can still get 10. You know what I mean? It's just up to the judge. It's called an upward departure. It means I found substantial reason to increase your sentence above what they have suggested. My guideline range with a six point enhancement for intent to carry out the crime. They gave me a six point fucking enhancement for <laughs> intent to carry out the crime because of false testimony that we disproved on the stand. But more about that on my channel. I don't know how much I should go into that here. There was allegedly yeah. probably... In my opinion, some blackmail going on and some people lied about me. That's over on my channel. Um, yeah. So he gave me a six-point enhancement for intent. My maximum recommended was two years. 
So I got up there and I acted like an asshole because I'd already been locked up for seven months. And I said, what's he going to do? Give me seven more months. I'm used to this life, bro. I'm, I'm a thug now. I was 21, been in jail since I was 19. So I get up there and I'm like, this is a generation gap. You guys just don't understand. This is common. This is what we do all the time. You guys just don't know. And boy, howdy, man. He said, okay, big Billy badass. Okay. Yeah, you tough. Oh, you think you're tough? I'm going to show you where the tough boys go, Billy badass. I got you right now. And he tripled my sentence, man. Gave me six years. You bet that wiped the oh. shit eating grin off of my face because I thought I might be going home that day. Uh, he could sentence me to time served. I'm right in my guideline range, 18 to 24. I did, 20, I did 17. Maybe he'll give me time served, you know? Uh, no. No, quite, quite the opposite. Uh, I realized my journey was just beginning on that day. I was like, oh, my God, I'm actually going to prison. Oh Not jail. I'm going to prison now, like big boy motherfucking. So I shaved my head and started doing push-ups. <laughs> Yeah, Dude, you know what's crazy? That's fair. <laughs> Man, this letter that you're sending, are, are you sending a physical letter to this dude? Absolutely not. Completely okay, illegal for me to do that. That's good. why I'm putting was, it on YouTube. I was going to say, please don't, don't do it, man. You're like, no, you're sir, poking Mr. the Racy. fucking wasp nest no, there. No, Jesus. No, yeah, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not poking the sleeping bear. I'm going to put it on YouTube <laughs> because I know that it will eventually get to him. I've already written the letter. It's six pages. I got a mouthful to say to him. And also keep in mind, everybody, that I know where the line is. I don't wish any ill on this judge. I don't want to hurt him. I don't want anyone to hurt him. I want his life to thrive. But at the end of the day, he did the right thing for my life for the wrong reasons, and I'm about to call him out on it. I know it's going to get back to him. I know somebody's going to show him that video. The FBI watches oh, yeah. the shit out of my channel, and I'm not being a paranoid crackhead about that. I know it for a fact that the FBI monitors my YouTube. They hate, they hate the publicity that my case has received. <laughs> it makes them look so stupid. And the mm -hmm. best part about that is I don't <laughs> lie. I can't lie about what they did or they can sue me for libel and perjury and all that good shit. All I do is tell the truth and they're embarrassed about it. That means you fucked up, not me, homie. You know Yo, what I mean? Real <laughs> quick, though, I didn't even know there was a difference between jail and prison. A lot of people what? don't. I just use the word jail loosely. Like, Yeah, yeah. Prison. Most people do. And the funny thing is, once you've been, you got a real bad ear for that. Somebody will be like, man, he committed murder. He's going to jail for the rest of his life. And I'm like, nobody goes to jail for the rest of their life. You go to jail prison. for a misdemeanor sentence that has a less than one year crime or while you're awaiting trial prison means you've been sentenced for a felony crime and you are serving some time big difference uh i would much rather be in prison because i'm cool with the people and i know how to navigate and in prison there's guitars and there's more tvs and a dvd room and there's shit to do in county jail you got a room a deck of cards and one tv where everybody wants to watch fucking monday night raw so <laughs> <laughs> monday night raw you know, wrestling <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they oh love God. it. They go crazy in there for it. All the convicts in there like, boy, wait till the Undertaker gets back in that bitch, man. Oh, you can't it. see me, John Cena. Yeah, they're all about that. Oh and God. I actually oh heard like God. the smartest thing ever about wrestling too because you know that the typical argument is, man, you know that shit's fake, right? So, of course, one guy pipes up from the back where nobody can punch him and he's like, yeah, shit's <laughs> and this dude was like, when you watch a movie, do you expect it to be real, motherfucker? We know it's fake. And I was like, damn, that was a really good answer, man. Yo, middle school, I didn't know it was fake. And then I was like, damn. <laughs> it was so dude, intense. I, what do you think is real? I, I, I have like a, a bit of a random question here. So obviously I'm from the UK. Uh, when you were in jail Lucky. or prison, were there any people there that were from foreign countries? And uh, do they get treated differently? How, how would I spend my time in prison if I were to be in an American an American prison? First off, they would call you a trip. That means that you're fun to hang out with. The dude talks funny. You know, funny. I'm not a, a, insulting your <laughs> accent. You know what I mean? That's their view on it. It's like, hey, he talks cool. It's different. You know, you got a good sense of humor. The sense of humor will get you everywhere. Exotic. That's a good way of putting it, Mitty. Yeah. It, the, the sense of humor. I don't, I don't think I like, man. dude. I don't think I like exotic for prison, man. <laughs> I don't think that's gonna end very fucking well, bro. No. There is an exotic somewhere in prison, isn't there? I think his name's Ooh. Joe. Oh, um, yeah. As far oh, as man. foreigners, tons from Central and South America. Um, one Vietnamese guy in all my years locked up. Oh, random. Um, yeah, he was white collar crime, but he had a history in his country, and they ended up jacking his points up, so he came to the violent, the medium high security prison with us. Uh, but he was chill as shit. He stayed out of the way and did his shit, you know. Um, there was a Jamaican, one Jamaican. He was cool as fuck. All the dude wanted to do was smoke weed. He did not care about the drug tests at all. He was like, man, they don't stop me from smoking my ganja, man. Hey, man, I smoked the ganja. So he's over here, like, rolling up joints, smoking in the cell. When the CO's walking around, not giving any fucks. And the dude would throw chicken bones on the ground and do all this. Oh, I, 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 I'm not trying to make fun of him. I'm giving an accurate. To me, it looked like this. But... Um, but no, most of them are from Central and South America if they're legitimate foreigners. Um, they essentially all have one gang if they're actually from another country. 
I don't want to shout out the name or nothing, but I got along with them very well. They were always very, very cool to me. The guys that were from the Central and South American countries, they loved the fact that I tried to learn Spanish and I'd ask them questions and be involved, you know. Uh, they thought that was real cool, uh, especially because I don't understand Spanish. I just speak it. And they thought that was a trip. So I have a sentence that I say in Spanish where I say I speak Spanish, but I don't understand it. It's too fast for my ears because I'm a white dude from America. And they go, you fucking with me? And then I'm like, what'd you say? And they just thought it was the funniest, you know. Um, most true. of them are actually in federal prison intentionally uh, when they're from the Southern American and, and uh, Central American countries because, Protection. as you guys might know, American prisons have labor. Uh, they have a, process, a program in the feds called Unicorn, just like Unicorn, but with no E, and I have no idea what the acronym is. And it's basically where you can make military pants, for example, at the one that I was at, or military shirts. They make them for the military. And you get paid approximately three to 30 cents an hour, busting your ass. The faster you work, the more money that you make. Obviously, it's production based. They're in there making the battle uniforms, the BDUs for uh, the military, which is making the government a fucking ton of money, only paying us this tiny amount. You know, it's a it's a huge unicor is massive, but they do pay you and dudes can make a few hundred dollars a month. And it's by far the best legitimate money you can make in the system. So they will come get arrested intentionally, work at Unicor, and send the checks back home. Straight up. They'll do it for their family. They don't give a fuck. They get in there and they're cool. They got all their homies with them. They're all eating good, you know, stealing food out of the kitchen to make really good meals, kicking back, just partying, basically. The only the only thing is there's, there's no girls, you know, as far as they're concerned. Yeah. They're just living life. And it's really sad that it comes to that, you know, but they come from poverty-stricken countries and stuff to where our money's worth so much more that it's worth it for them. Or they just got caught coming back into the country. They've been deported once or twice, second or third time. They'll send you to prison for it. It's straight up illegal. I didn't know that. Damn. But that's, you would be uh, fine, bro. That's nuts. You would okay, be fine. Okay, well, that, that's good to know. Because uh, I I won't go into it, but I did get um, detained when I was actually living in America. And uh, Oh, fuck. I did think I was going to be spending a night in jail. I'm not going to lie. That was terrifying. But, um, you know, speaking on money in prison, so... I've watched enough like prison documentaries and stuff to know that quite a few people in prison have like side hustles and things Absolutely. they do in there. Mm -hmm. So did you have a side hustle to make you money when you were in there? Absolutely did. I typed legal motions and emails for people, put my RuneScape skills to the, put my selling lobbies, 250 each 10,000 times to the test. <laughs> um, that was my hustle. And it was actually a very, very profitable hustle. Uh, I basically, it's it's amazing. It's actually a business ring, bro. You'd be surprised. I didn't come up with this or do this myself. It's a group of guys and they have legal books and they got the the typewriter ribbons because you have access to typewriters in prison for motions, you know. They got the rulers, they got I mean like and and it's like they got a boss dog and anybody that needs a legal motion goes to him. He will then outsource it to us. We take a book that is literally just a template of different legal motions. We go down there and type it with his name on it. 20 bucks. Takes me takes me fucking fifteen minutes. I like making more money out there than I could make in, in on the streets. You know what I mean? Um, huh. And it was a massive Damn. hustle. And the dude that organized it all took a fat cut. And you did not want to try and do this beneath him or behind his back. These dudes were Puerto Ricans. They'd have fucked me up. So I just kept it cool with my boss. You know, boss. Uh, I mean, it's not like the dude could tell me what to do or what cell to go to, et cetera. But he told me what work to do, and he'd say, "Josh, I got one for you. Uh, you know, it's a Puerto Rican guy. Hit this up. We don't need it till Thursday." Okay, cool. Well, I've got some free time because I don't have band practice after lunch. I go out there, type it up. I go to him. He gives me stamps. Stamps are the money in the feds. I don't think they do that in the state. Uh, current commissary is obviously considered cash money as well, but but the placeholder mm. is stamps. That's our paper money. So my points on my Twitch are stamps, my channel points. Um, <laughs> but yeah, man, it, it, the dudes do high side hustles. They cook prison food that looks amazing. I mean, they come up with these crazy concoctions and make pizzas that look like Pizza Hut. You know, it's incredible, man. They make cheesecake out of creamer and candy out of creamer. They really, necessity is the mother of invention, man. And you learn that big time in prison because with the limited resource they have, they do amazing things. Some dudes do simple shit. They buy soda from the commissary. They go to the rec yard, throw it in a bag. Of, you know, they get some ice out of the ice machine, dump it in a mop bucket, throw the sodas in there, two stamps each. Boom. So they're all day, make a ton of money, you know. And dudes actually legitimately make enough money. And I will say that I was involved in supporting this to send money to their families. They're dudes that pay their house bills from prison because they're hustling so hard, you know. And I've been one. I need $100 worth of stamps because, you know, I got stuff to do or I'm trying to pay bills because it's all a loan system and barter system, really. I need stamps. So, I, you know, covertly call my people. They send his mom 100 bucks, and he gives me the stamps. He just paid his mom's light bill. You know what I mean? I often just hustle in prison. So, yeah, it's a huge thing. And I'm sorry that I get carried away and give 10-minute explanations, guys. Oh, no, but it is good. a very in-depth alternate universe, in my opinion. You know, the, the layers of it are absolutely astounding. And I think also that anybody who listens to me often and 
picks up on what I'm saying, man, and pays attention would be perfectly fine in jail and prison. I'm telling you, man, I made it. You guys can too. I don't care how nerdy, how little, how fucking antisocial you are. It's all about being a good person, bro. It, that's really what it boils down to. Not having an ego. Agreed. Agreed. Now, it seems like you've made a pretty awesome job out of your colorful lifestyle. I'm wondering, have you ever thought about writing a book or maybe you've already written a book I don't know about? So I've started on it like three times. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking with a company prior to my incarceration that wanted to publish my book. Uh, this is when the story was really hot. Uh, it's kind of faded a little bit now, obviously. Uh, this is like at the peak of the silent core video. And I was going on like, you know, the Blink 155 podcast, which is small, but somehow got a lot of attention um, because I don't really say no to anything. Anybody wants me on a podcast, man, I'm down to shoot the shit with whoever. Um, that's why I've been on Charlie three times, you know, just because I'll just sit here and shoot the breeze and let the podcast guys let kick back and, <laughs> I'll yap the whole time. Um, but yeah, man, I do have every intention of doing it. And the thing about it is everybody in the feds is writing a book because everybody thinks their story is unique. So to me, it almost feels egotistical that I'm writing a book. I'm writing a book. You know, I'm not, I'm not like that at all. Um, I literally went to rec yard one day, standing in a cage with five guys. And one of them started talking about, man, you should write a book because your story's crazy. And I said, man, I don't know. It seems to me like every federal inmate is writing a book. The rest of the rec hour those five guys spent time talking about their books that they're writing. So <laughs> kind, of, kind of fucking prove my point, but um, I do intend to man. And I would like to point out guys, it doesn't come for me. I, for me, I almost feel a responsibility to do it. This isn't about making money or about, you know, Oh, my story for no, me should, or I'm a victim. You should make some money. You should make some money off. If, if I do, I think that's a wonderful thing, man. Yeah. But, but the way that I see it and it, that'd be great, you know, to have my family said, I could have $10 million and I'd still stream old school because I fucking love this game and I love streaming. I think it's great. Um, no matter how that works out, I still want to play my game. Uh, the book, I mainly see it as I feel like I have a responsibility to share the story and share how I overcame it because think about, and, and I'm not comparing myself to this, but Victor Frankel, man, the Holocaust survivor, man, search for meaning. What if he wouldn't have written that? You know what I mean? And my scale is so much smaller compared to his. Please understand I'm not comparing it, but I'm saying that I feel like in suffering and overcoming and in pain, there's a great beauty to be shared, man. You can tell other people like, guys, you got this, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a story of overcoming and, and what's the word that I'm looking here for redemption arc. You know, it's my anime redemption arc. Hell and yeah. I want other people to know, man, that even when literally your country is against you, you can overcome and prevail, man. And, and I don't know. I think that, I, I think that I have an important thing to say just about overcoming basically, man, and redemption and sharing also the dark side of the FBI and the prosecution system, man, they're fucked. They're fucked up. And I never knew it. I always assumed before my incarceration, and a lot of people still think this. I was like, bad guys go to prison. If you weren't going to do it or you're innocent, you don't go. Bro, I was wrong. That ain't how it works, man. That ain't how it works at all. I'm telling everybody, man. That's not how it goes. Yeah, you will go to prison if you get caught in that net. They're going to send you. They have a 99, 98% conviction rate. You're going to fucking prison, man. And it's a problem. And I'd like to expose it, uh, mainly to keep this from happening to other people. Once a week no. in my Twitch chat, somebody says, dude, I used to talk like you on RuneScape. I saw your case and I stopped. And I'm like, every person that tells me that, it's more worth it, bro. Man. The real question, you, though. Yeah. You go for it, Ray. You go All for right, it. So, so this, this is interesting, right? Because prison, for a lot of people, right, that don't, haven't looked into it much, it's like, oh, yeah, you only bad person go there, right? But, mm -hmm. but it's not the case, especially in the U.S., right? Because the U.S., there's this complex where there's, you know, financial incentives, right, to get people in there. So it's, it's incredibly biased. But what about other countries? Have you looked at other countries? Like, for example, European countries, like their prisons, right? Yes. Like, like, have you looked into it? And like, have you ever like compared your experience and like, you know, how you got punished, how long you, you had to stay versus like the people that would get that would go to prison there, you know? Absolutely. In, like, a Swedish country or something, you know? Specifically like, Sweden, as a matter of fact, is a good. Place. Yeah, exactly. Like, what's your take on that? You know, the comparisons. Uh like what's more fair? Or, it's crazy. Or, or, <laughs> it's crazy how these other countries have, man. Like the guy, I don't remember his name, man. The dude that, that went on a shooting spree and, and like murdered a bunch of Muslims, man. You know that guy, Anders? I don't even need to shout out his name. Dude, there's whatever a lot, the fuck. There's a lot, he dude, went on man. a hunger strike in prison for more video games. Bro, he can, ooh, I'm not even going to say it on YouTube, man. That, that dude, oh my God. I was sitting in a concrete room with books. You know what I mean? Every, for You're locked in your cell eight hours a day. You're only out for 16. And when I'm out, I'm playing a $50 beat up acoustic guitar. This dude's going on hunger strike for more video games after he murdered a bunch of innocent people. Oh man. And also, you know, Sweden has a maximum sentence. 
Uh, I don't know if you guys are aware of that. I don't know why anybody would be aware of that if you're not involved in this or from there. But Sweden and I think maybe the other Scandinavian countries, the most time you can get in prison is 21 years. You cannot under any circumstances get more. It's called like the ultimate sentence or something like that. And surprisingly, it has an extremely effective recidivism rate. People who receive that sentence and serve 21 years get out and they statistically don't commit crimes anymore. It's amazing because in our, we have a 92% recidivism rate. I'm in that rate. 92% of males, specifically males, I'm not sure about females, 92% of men in prison in America either have been before, will be back, or have been twice, and I'm in that statistic. Because the, the net for your probation and shit like that, it's, it's a trap, man. Uh, I mean, they are going hard on you. They're investigating your life. They can come tear up your computers. I, it smells like weed in here. You know, they're shaking your house down. Like, they, they go hard. The PO that I just had, I finished my probation about a month ago, by the way, guys. Woo! Free man. Um, well done, uh, dude. Yeah, Thanks, man. I didn't even get a warning this time. So I would, <laughs> like to, I would like to also give credit to my PO because I had a really cool PO. I wasn't doing anything wrong. He sensed it. He knew my character. The other guys, they looked me in the eyes and they knew I was doing wrong, man. You know, I had nothing to hide this time. I was like, bro, you, you can, you can, I'll piss in whatever cup you want. You can look wherever you want. I'll go to my mandatory therapy. You got no problems out of me. And it went really smoothly for the, me this time because I used it as an asset instead of a guillotine hanging over my head. Um, and that really changed my view on it. Um, dude, other countries got it made, but I will say it is impossible for one man to judge another man's suffering. Somebody might be over there playing their Xbox in prison and, you know, having their weekend free world visits that they get and miserable as shit way more miserable than i was it's all relative you know what i mean so maybe they yeah. think that that's a hard time i'm not trying to diss on them or say they got it you know oh you guys are pussies or whatever it's not like that yeah just look at the stats you know just yeah it's just it's strange and, it, and it's strange also how successful other countries i mean the uk doesn't have it nearly as high as a, of a recidivism rate like if you look at the statistics nope. america has to be statistically the most evil country in the world if you go by incarceration i think it's Something's like wrong. Um, I mean, yeah. out, out in America, it's a massive business. Like, they make a lot of money through locking people up. And, um, like, I, I will add this, right? So, ever since I was detained when I was in America, I started watching loads of videos on, like, you know, people being pulled over by the police and so forth. Mm -hmm. And there is... It, the difference between the police here in the UK that I've personally dealt with and then the police in America, like... All, all I can really put it down to is their training is so unprofessional, it seems, because the encounters that American police, and I've got nothing against police, by the way, because I've never really had a bad encounter. Even the time I was detained, aside from having guns pulled on me where I was I was shit in my pants. Yeah, it was that like, ain't a good feeling, bro. I feel you. <laughs> it, no, it's fucking terrifying because I was it like, is. if I make one wrong step here, you don't know I what to do. Statistic. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, but like, the professionalism, <laughs> like, dude, yeah. mate, 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 I watch videos of, like, American cops pulling people over, and sometimes it's almost like they're trying to, they're trying to stir the pot, like, they're trying to get a reaction from the person, and it's crazy, like, because here in, the, here in the UK, it's like, they try to, like, detonate the situation, like, they try and defuse it, sorry, they try to defuse the situation, they try to, like, you know, bring it Compassion. back down level-headed whereas in america like I'll, I'll watch videos on it and stuff and like i ain't got a problem with police but when i watch like a police officer emotionally trying to get inside somebody's head i'm just like yep i'm not fucking surprised people start doing crazy shit because if you have <laughs> some fucking parrot that's like saying yapping in your ear like why are you being like that like you know why are you talking like it's like you're your eyes are kind of red. You don't even know me, bro. Maybe I got red eyes. <laughs> it's like you're so you're supposed to defuse the situation. That's how I see it. I'm like, police should be there to try and defuse the situation, get everybody back to a safe and happy place, instead of trying to boil that pot over. Um, Absolutely. But you know, speaking of countries that have like basically no crime and stuff like that, uh, I'm sure there's people watching this podcast that know better than I I do. It's a European country. It might be like the Netherlands or something like that, Denmark or something along those lines, where like people who go to prison, it, it, like they go there and they get like an option, like, hey, what would you like to become? And it's like they get to choose what career they'd like to do. And it's like, you know, the crime rate is just minimal. And people aren't, after they've gone to prison, people aren't punished after. It's like once you've done your time, it's done. It's like your record's clean. You can go get a job doing whatever it is. 
It's a and, very interesting uh, they, point. They also educate you while you're there, you know? Because, like, when you think about it, it's like people that go to prison, it's like you said, it's like I'm sure there's a lot of people that are decent people, may have made mm -hmm. dumb mistakes and decisions, probably quite similar to yourself. And it's like when you're put into a position where people try to help you, and they try to make you better yourself. And it's like, hey, would you like to become an engineer? Would you like to get into like computer science? It's like, that's a lot better than being like, no, we're just going to lock you up and you're going to have to just fight your, your way through this. Yep. That's you, it. Yeah, we're just going to put you in a cage and leave you. Like, I, I, I genuinely think a lot. I'm just like, whenever I watch prison documentaries, I'm just like, man, if I ever go to prison for some shit, I'm going to have a blast. Like, I'm just like, I'm <laughs> glad I don't live in America because that shit looks horrible. It's but, pretty rough. Yeah. I, I, I will uh, advise it. I, you made a very interesting point about, um, you know, rehabilitation. There's, there's not a rehabilitation aspect in American prison, and that's a key difference here. I will admit and say that in federal prison, there are like certain vocational programs that you can do and you can do mail away degrees. There is no incentive. There is no help. They don't tell you how to do it. They don't tell you you can do it most of the time. Um, and it's totally up to you. So I've got the option of going out here and getting high and playing guitar in a band all day or going in there and learning how to weld when I've got six years left to do. I didn't go in there and learn how to weld. Fucking should I have? Probably. But I had no... I didn't know anything about it. They don't really talk about it in there. You know what I mean? And, and you have to get cleared for it because there's gas in there, you know, and I probably couldn't have fucking done it anyways. I actually got fired from a uh, construction crew job in prison where we go fix stuff up because of my charge. I ended up having to get fired because I wasn't allowed to have wrenches and shit because <laughs> they thought I would make a bomb. Uh, rehabilitation <laughs> is essentially non-existent. <laughs> non-existent rehabilitation in, in a federal prison. I cannot speak on state prison. And let me give a disclaimer. Everything I've said so far is from the perspective of federal prison. I don't know yeah. anything about state. I mean, there's there's two sides to this, isn't there? Because I there's a lot of people that say, you know, why should people who've broken the law be educated, and why should they be given options that people who have abided the law not yep. had? And I, I I get that. Like I do. It's it's like, well, do you know what? If I can get a free education, but I just got to go to prison, like you don't want to incentivize that. But at the Certainly. same time, it's like there has to be a better option other than that. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Uh, Most of the guys that I know that were doing life sentences for like third strike automatic, like they sold crack, got caught two, three times or whatever. Maybe they had a pistol automatic life sentence. For one thing, after they've done 20, 25 years, they wouldn't do it again. Trust me. But most of them, they're back in there because they got out. They did not improve themselves in prison. They received no education and they had no choice. They couldn't get a job now because now they're a felon. So you got McDonald's. And they're going back to try and support their kids and their wife, you know, and they're trying to get back to normal. And they do what they do best, man. They know how to make quick money. And also, I would like to point out that you made an excellent point again. I met some of the greatest people that I've ever met in my life in prison. I met some of the most honorable, kind, compassionate men that you could ever imagine that I had true friendships with. And I know that people probably in the comments will say, oh, gay or whatever, bro. But <laughs> friendship and, and, and legitimately love will get you through this shit, man. You've got to find your homies. And I have met some of the best, most similar to me people that I've ever met in my life in there. Dudes that would, I would give them a million dollars in the car key and say, hang on, I'll be right back. And I know they wouldn't do it, you know? It, good people do go to prison. It's not all just criminals and bad people. It's people that made dumb mistakes. My best friend in my entire life that I loved to death, that called me two weeks ago, a guy that I would fucking pay every penny that I had to get out of prison if I possibly could, is in there for 30 years for computer hacking, bro. It was technically espionage. But there's amazing people in there, man. There's really good people that are very knowledgeable about a lot of things. I read 900 books the last I counted when I was in there. I used it as an opportunity to improve myself. Another big influence on me was the autobiography of Malcolm X because he served seven years in prison for a crime that typically serves one. And he said, and even though I'm not a Muslim, but you can take inspiration from anywhere, guys, <laughs> to the chat, not y'all. Um, he said, turn your cell into your school and your monastery. And man, that was it for me. You know, I, I jumped on that with both feet. I was like, man, he's right. I've got, I'm locked in this concrete room. This, this room that you see behind me is significantly larger than my cell. It's at least twice as large. And I lived in there with three men. You know, I was locked in there eight hours a day. And I was like, you know what I'm about to do? I'm going to go to the fucking library. I'm going to see if they have any books. When that door locks, instead of sitting here trying to get higher or, you know, dicking around, drawing pictures or whatever and flipping through magazines, I'm going to read. I'm going to read some classics. 
that's what I'm going to do. So I went down there and I found the first Game of Thrones book. Boy, was that crack for me. I ended up reading that whole series. I read that whole series cover to cover six times. And I'm so particular about it that when I got out, I started watching the first episode. Hell yeah, I get to see this, man. Finally, bet. They zoom in on Danny Targaryen's face and she had like Amelia Clark's regular colored eyes. I turned that shit off and I'm not watching it. it <laughs> I, I can't do it. It gives me high blood pressure. When, when one of my favorite books is made to TV or movie and they fuck shit up, it makes me feel like somebody broke into my house and drew a mustache on a picture of my daughter. So I'm not, I'm not fucking with it. Uh, I, Yo, I hope everybody all, it's enjoys it. It's all good because the ending was pretty, you know. So. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if he's going to do the same thing in the book, so please don't tell me. Please don't tell me because the books it, are still stuck at five. I don't, I don't want any spoilers because okay. they might. No, do the they'll probably the stay book. five. Just don't read worry. the books. When the book comes out, I'm a, I'm a, yeah, exactly. Five and back. Like where I left off was, well, no spoilers in the chat, but. And reading books more. <laughs> saved my ass, man. My mom sent me music theory books, and I read them in three days. I, I, and the thing about music theory is when you first started, I don't know if you guys know music theory or not. When you first started, that shit is fucking confusing. It's like math and science combined, and you're over here like, what What the hell do you mean? Like a, a fucking quaver and shit, you know, and thirds and, and d- diminished sevenths. And I read that page over and over until it clicked. And then I had what the, the musical epiphany. My mom sent me more music theory. I devoured it. I learned a craft in there, man, as far as music theory goes. I know enough to teach people. You know, I studied master level music theory. Do I have a degree? Fuck no. Did I improve myself and I'm happy about it? Yeah, absolutely, man. There's a lot of people in there that do use the time to improve their, themselves. Most don't. Most oh, yeah, do not. Sure. Mm-hmm. By I, wide like, like you said, right? Like you said, because they don't really like try to guide you, you know, with that stuff at all. So, yep. like somehow you just manage to find the uh you know just the right factors to get you going you know like get Found you the light in the tunnel man the music like yeah i i just can't imagine like you know u.s prison i don't they're there to try to make you stay like well maybe not the direct people that are working in the prison but like obviously the higher ups right the people that fund this shit mm-hmm. right like they have an agenda that is not about whether or not they're gonna make you a better person right their agenda is all right how do we cram in people money and make them stay and work for us, do labor, you know, do that kind of stuff, you know, help us make money, right? And and it's so fucked up. I, I can't get too deep, obviously, because I, I don't know enough, but like you can tell that it exists and it's mm-hmm. a thing, you know, and I'm not really sure if it's getting better, but like they're there. It doesn't seem like it. You know, they're there and and their goal is not necessarily help you become a better person right like not at all they make money yeah. from pr- prison privatization in america man you said it yeah. you said it right at the beginning i was kind of surprised you guys definitely know more about this than you think you do i believe but uh yeah prison privatization man people own prisons there have been multiple cases where they busted judges who were sentencing people hard because the prison was paying them behind the back you know what i mean hey look man i'm gonna give you a hundred thousand dollars no probation none and the judge is like okay they notice a trend hold on his sentence has just increased by like 88 percent on average they, they start investigating, and they were crooked, you know? The oh, prison's yeah. still running. They didn't get in any fucking trouble. I think the judge lost a seat, but they didn't go to prison like I would have, you know, for this corruption. Um, yeah. And I would like to point out also, uh, Rakes, you mentioned earlier about police, and people naturally assume that I'm probably a big, fat cop hater, and I got all this to say about it, and I'm not, man. I don't judge anybody or any group of people. Uh, it, that extends to police. It extends to gay, black, white Asian, I don't care. I judge people by their character on an individual basis. I don't think cops are inherently corrupt. The system itself absolutely is. I get nervous around cops. I do. I've got, I mean, I, I have to, I had to go to therapy for my, for as part of my probation because I had a mental case, you know, he was going to go blow some shit up or whatever. And she does believe that I've got a small degree of PTSD. I'm not going to take any medicine for it. I'm not tripping about it. I'm not trying to get any pity or anything. I get nervous around cops. When I see a cop yeah. car, my blood pressure goes up, man. My, my face turns red, and I start. And I'm not doing anything wrong. I just can't. Help I think it that's a natural... I didn't do anything wrong the first time, really. I kind of did, yeah. but I know yeah. now that you don't have to really do anything. And I will say, man, when I see a cop, I treat him like a man. I respect them. They want respect. I don't think all cops are bastards or anything like that. I'm not with all that, man. Judge humans on how they interact with you, bro. Don't ever generalize. It's never going to get you anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Agreed. Definitely agreed on that. I mean, um, that was a uh, like. You know what? When I got detained by the uh, the American police, um, it was like being in a movie because, uh, firstly, here in the UK, like the only guns you really have out here are pellet guns. You got shotguns, but you have to have licenses to have them. You have to have like references. People have to be contacted. Like, there's a whole pro- mm-hmm. like process to getting any kind of firearm here in the UK. So when I got pulled over by the police in America, and God, I think it was probably like 
it was, it was about five police cars and like one big like police van. Yeah, um, the paddy wagon. It, it's called the paddy wagon. <laughs> oh my god! It was Are it you? was an ex- dude. It was such a it was it was crazy, right? Because uh, so wait, this is when up- you got the guns drawn on you, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I bet that was an experience for UK. Dude, they didn't come up to the window, but it was a fucked up moment because they just started talking over like the megaphone. They had like full beam lights on the car, couldn't see shit. <laughs> and uh, it was Paranoid. all right. So I, I was with this girl at the time and she was driving. So I was uh, I was in the passenger seat. And uh, as we got pulled over, she was there. She was like hands on the steering wheel. She was freaking out. And I was there like, I was like, don't worry about it. It's going to be fine. You haven't done nothing wrong. And then it comes over the megaphone. It's like, can the passenger put his hands in the air? Yep. Uh-huh. And I'm like, I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, what the fuck? Please step out of the vehicle with your hands I start fucking freaking out. I'm like, oh my fucking God, they want me. And I'm just there thinking like, what have I, what have I done? I was like, have I actually done something? I was questioning it. I was like, fuck, what have I done? Uh, anyways, they're like, you know, open up the door, stand out the car, hands above your head. And uh, the curbs out in America are fucking huge. So in the UK, curbs are only small little things. But out there, you got curbs that have big fucking drops and stuff. And the guy's mm-hmm. like, okay, keep your hands in the air. Um, yeah, He said something like, do you have any weapons on you? I was like, no, I don't have any weapons on that. me. Mm-hmm. And... Um, what did he say to me? He said, uh, you have anything your in your pockets going to stick me, stab me, poke me? Oh, your name. He, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, is your name such and such? And I said, no, my name is Tom. And uh, he said, he said, where are you from? And I was like, I'm from England. <laughs> and he was like, from where? <laughs> I was like, I'm from, I'm from the United Kingdom. And because like it was in, uh, uh, what's it called? He Sacramento. Don't know what the Sacramento in California. So the last person they expected to fucking pull over was an English bloke because like Sacramento (laughs) is not a place for tourists. And, uh, you know, I walk back, he grabs my hands. He's like, do you have your ID in that? I was like, yeah, it's my wallet. And then they sat me in the back of the van and I was there for God. I was in the back of that van for about 15 minutes. And those vans are uncomfortable as fuck, man. Mm -hmm. I got to say, dude, because they rip all the seats out and shit. You're just sat on like the plastic. No seat belts or nothing. And uh, I was just up. sat there. I, I was sat back. there. What the fuck? I was, dude, I can't remember if they cuffed me. I, no, they, they, they did. Pr- they probably me. did. They huh? did. Yeah, they did cuff me because he took my hands, put them behind my back. Behind your back. Mm-hmm. And I must have been sat there with them on. I, I can't. It was so. It was like five years ago now. Yeah, and you I were legally detained there. at that point. What, like legally speaking, you were detained. They were going to cuff you up, make sure you didn't go nowhere. Yeah. Um, but I was sat there for like 15 minutes and, uh, I was just sat there and I was just thinking in my head, I was like, yeah, I'm going to prison tonight. I'm going to jail. I was, I was convinced. And I was just thinking like, <laughs> fuck man, why me? What, why is this shit happening? I'm not from this country. I'm instantly going to be standing out amongst every fucking person there. Be- like, and I was just like, yep. fuck. I was like, I'm in some shit right now. And then the guy came over to the door, opened it up. He's like, yeah, we sort it out. You're not the person we're looking for. And uh, I got out and I just chatted with them for like five, 10 minutes. And they were really cool guys, but like, they got to do a job know, though. Yeah, no, exactly. It was, I was just like, you know, it's fair enough. They thought I was somebody that I wasn't. It was just a whole misunderstanding. But like when they told me to walk back, part of the walking back in a straight line was me walking off the curb <laughs> onto like the road towards them. He's definitely drunk. I, just, I just remember my heart was just, fucking jumping out my chest because i was like dude if i if i fall fucking back or if i do some stupid shit or i can't hear them i was like yeah i could literally everything could just be black in a few moments time and that could be it forever that's the that that's, was, isn't that the that scariest shit bro head. that's the worst yeah. part is that when they have those guns on you're like literally like i can die right fucking now and i don't know how to stop it or, or change it <laughs> like can you can you imagine that it's like i wasn't even the guy they were after it was it was mistaken identity yeah, but um, like the funny thing is, like you know, all the encounters I've ever had with police, honestly, like they've all been really pleasant. Like here in the UK and stuff, it's like they are literally just there to sort stuff out. It's like if you walk by a police officer down the road, like they'll say good morning to you. It's like good morning, how are you? That's it. You just go on with your day. It's not like what are you up to, boy? What's in your pockets? Like, what, what's in your pockets? You know, it, it's nothing like that. They're just they're trying to keep the peace. Like that's the point in it, you know? Absolutely. And I personally believe that at heart, most police officers that I personally have met do believe in their job serving the greater good. And I will say that absolutely. 
And I do believe that at the core, they're good people. I know that sometimes things go over their head, like the, the, their power, you know, their boss is like, no, you're getting that. I'm aware of that. There's corruption that is rife. But on average, man, I don't believe that police or men are inherently corrupt. Uh, once it goes above their head, it starts getting pretty fucking shady. But um, man, I'm not I'm not anti-cop at all. Most of the cops that I met here are the same way, Rexy, man. You can walk past and say good morning. They're just like, hey, man, how's it going? You know, and and they're there just trying to keep an eye out. Like I've being raised in a small town in the South, uh, I went to New York City a few months before I got arrested, which was my first major city other than Memphis. Um, and there were cops everywhere. I mean, holy shit, cops everywhere. They, everywhere there are people, there's like 30 cops. Like for there's a cop for every three people, you know. And I was really surprised. I was like, this is weird. And they were all so kicked back. I saw a dude rolling a joint in uh, Union Square Park or whatever it's called. I barely even remember now, man. But he was rolling a joint. And the cop Eating walked donuts. up to him. Yeah. The, the cop just walks up to him. And he's like, what are you doing? I was standing 10 feet away from him. He goes, oh, shit, bro. Hey, I was just rolling a joint. He goes, you got a backpack? And he goes, no. He said, are you selling it? And he said, no. And he said, Fuck, all right, man. And he turned and walked off. <laughs> just let him go about his business. He wasn't tripping about the yeah. dude smoking a joint. He was just like, you don't got a pound in your bag, do you? Like, is this something that I really need to? And he's like, you got a backpack anywhere? And he said, no, sir. He said, are you selling this right now? Or are you just about to smoke? And he said, man, I'm just going to smoke. And he was like, man, fucking, all right, cool. He's got better shit to worry about, you know? Yeah. I pulled over in Memphis when I was uh, 18, actually, with a, a very a felony amount of marijuana. Like, not a misdemeanor, like a felony. Uh, and we got pulled over, and the cop found it our car smelled like a skunk's ass uh he rolled the window down and the cop probably got the munchies uh he was like all right all right he, i mean it, as soon as we rolled the window down he was like do you know why I yeah get out of the car <laughs> so, uh, so we all get out he pops open the glove box where we so cleverly hit it and uh pulls out a very substantial bag of high grade marijuana and he's like what are you gonna do with this we were like man we, we just smoke bro we're not dealers or nothing like i'm a skinny nerdy white kid that plays runescape I'm 18. I'm not driving this car. I'm not legally responsible for any of this, you know, and everybody else is like, bro, we were just going to smoke, man. We're just having a good time. And that cop walked over to the gutter on the side of the road and just dumped it all down the vent, threw the bag in and said, y'all have a good day, man. Got better shit. Got better shit to worry about. In a major city, they got better shit to worry about. You know what I mean? I did get arrested at age 18 for possession of marijuana for this much. I had, I had less than a gram. It was like, it was like eight tenths of a gram of some shitty brown crap weed. And I got arrested and like fully straight up probation. Like they went hard on me as fuck, you know, in Memphis, where shit's going down, he's not worried about some 18-year-old smoking weed, man. So I guess it kind of depends on, you know, the location, the region, the history, the factors, you know, maybe like cops the states, in the riding yeah. places are a little more on edge and maybe they're not trying mm -hmm. to be friendly with people, you know, but in small town Mississippi, they're not making quota if there is a quota, which I hope there isn't. They don't have much to arrest people for. 90% of their arrests are drunk driving and possession of marijuana, basic possession. So personally, I guess it just depends <laughs> on where, what historical factors there are, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, the United States is more more like 50 different countries, you know? Damn right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it goes both ways as well, because yeah. I, I've seen loads of videos, like, of these people where, like, they stand up to the cops when they get pulled over and stuff. I don't know if you guys have seen that. Yeah, I've seen that. But it, it goes both ways, because it's like, in some of these videos, like, people are just giving them a hard time. Absolutely. And, like, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's like, there are times when it's like, yeah, you definitely <laughs> should give them a hard time if they're taking the piss with it. But, like, yeah. at the same time, it's like, if you go out of your way to make their job very difficult when they've been nothing but kind and polite to you and they're simply doing a job, it's like, don't make it hard for them because it makes it hard mm -hmm. for you. Exactly. Like instead, instead, like if you have nothing to hide and you literally are just there, just like, hey, I'm trying to get to work. It's like there's no point in being like, I won't talk to you. I have nothing to say because then yeah, it gets man. like a longer process. You're probably going to get fined and all that shit. It's just yeah, I agree, man. A lot of times people come in hot and then whenever shit goes south, they blame the cop. You know what I mean? The cop walks up to their window. Totally fine. Good mood. Maybe they were speeding. You know, they roll a window down. And they're like, officer, I don't have to say anything to you, you asshole. Like. <laughs> the dude's a person. Right. He's a human. He has feelings. You don't have to do that to him. You know what I mean? I will say this much, and this is a tip for everybody in America. If you have any interaction with a cop, respect him. You will get off the hook 99% of the time for showing respect. If it's just a cop and a cop encounter getting pulled over, tell them, yes, sir. Tell them, I'm sorry. Bow down a little bit. They want that. They want to know that they're in control and that they are succeeding at keeping the shit straight. So just be good, guys. Minty, where are you from, by the way? I feel like I've been talking over you this whole time, man. I'm sorry. You know, Minty's no, sick, I, so. I have a sore Ooh. throat, man, but you are absolutely killing this podcast. I'm from Cali, but I, I wanted to say to Lucky. you, because you're absolutely just murdering this podcast right now. Have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? Maybe like a prison 
podcast where you can get on people who have reformed or you could do anything really. It doesn't have to. Do I've it. considered it because I have a lot of ex cellmates that are out now that I'm friends with. Some of them have already gone back, but um, I will also say that we actually had old school rune cast last year. I don't know if you guys know me and uh, my friends, monkey commando and twist, but uh, it kind of fell apart. Some real life stuff happened with my friends and we kind of just disbanded. And then also you guys came out. I was completely unaware that it was y'all. So I saw this other podcast coming out and I was like, oh shit, they're going to smoke us. Y'all had a mod on or something. Maybe it was Ash. I don't remember, but it was like, oh, not was yet, that y'all? Not yet. Not, not mine. yet. Okay. It, it was, so, Ash, yeah, so. I know it was an announcement and I was like, oh, they're going to crush us. We had behemoth and moat plocks. You know what I mean? Like, that, don't oh, get me no, wrong. Behemoth good, is absolutely but, legend. But they, yeah, they're great. We need great. to lose two on at some point. We and also would do. like to, I would like to brag real quick that I messaged Zezma on Twitter a few days ago. We, were, we sent a couple messages back and forth and my fucking life was made. Fucking Grandmaster <laughs> Combat Achievement Unlocked message Zezma on Twitter because he followed me and I just couldn't help it. I had to fucking, I was like, yo, just real quick, bro, <laughs> you're my fucking hero. When I was in fifth grade, I told my whole lunch table that I killed you in the wilderness and they all thought I was the coolest kid in school for like two weeks. Like, you're the fucking legend and I love you. And he wrote me back. So maybe I can give you guys some plugs. Y'all are way more important <laughs> than me. You probably all already talked to Zezma, but it just happened to me and I'm very happy about it. Um, no, I don't really have any intention at this point of starting my own podcast, man. It's a possibility in the future. My following, I feel like, I mean, I don't know. It's possible. I'm friends with big prison channels. Lockdown 23 and 1, I went on his. I don't know if you know, guys know about him. And then, like I said, I'm going to absolutely show 100% humility here. My career and what I do now is not because of me. It's because of the people that lifted me up and made videos about me. Crumb, Moat Plocks, Lockdown 23 and 1, Silent Core, of course. Big Silent Core started it all. Uh, I went on Count Dankula. Please keep in mind, everybody, that when I go on a podcast, it doesn't mean that I agree or disagree with their political beliefs. It just means that I like to shoot the shit with people and the dude's got a good sense of humor because people are like, yo, you're a Nazi. You were talking to Count Dankula. And it's not like that at all. And neither is he. Um, man, I just enjoy coming on with other people, honestly, at this point. I'm not really the one that wants to. It's going to sound stupid because I talk so much, but I don't really want the spotlight. You know, I, I would like to say that I'm very impressed with you guys' questions and your interaction here because sometimes I, I've been on stuff and you know, two or three of the guys are zoned out or they're not paying attention and they don't contribute anything to conversation. And I didn't mean to talk over you this whole time, man, but um, I think you guys are the reason that you guys gave me the push and the platform to be able to, you know, oh, get my yeah. side. I mean, to be honest with you, man, like you, you have such a unique story. It'd be such a waste if we didn't hear you out, man. You can ramble as much as you want, bro. Like it's interesting well, as well it. because like a lot of the, the conversations not even being RuneScape related, which is... We don't do that that often. So, I mean, the <laughs> maybe, fact that we've all we been turn engaged. Yes, <laughs> I, get, I think this is important, you know? This is, yes, this I do is get important. pillory guard random events. They did not remove pillory guard <laughs> random events, and I still get triggered when I see it. You're under arrest, dead felon. <laughs> Fuck! Uh, At Christ. least I can teleport in the game, you know? But for what <laughs> it's worth, just in case anybody's curious, I do stream and play old school RuneScape all day, every day. I'm just as addicted as these guys are, uh, and I stream at twitch.tv slash shapelot. Fuck, I already oh. said that. I shouldn't say it again. Are you going to play dead download? That's the real question. I consider doing it for swapping for money for my main, but honestly, no. I'm planning on starting a really big Chambers of Zayric grind tomorrow on stream and uh, going hard for about a week or two. I talked to my friends about their work and sleep schedules, and we're about to go in and you know blast out probably three, 400 raids. Um, no, I'm not going to do dead man mode. I'm glad that they changed some of the rules in a way that seems like it benefits PKers. I'm glad that they hear the community out because whether people like it or not, the fact is that our community fucking loves us and they listen to what we say and they hear us out and they really, really try their best to warp things into our favor as we want it. Uh, I love our mods. I think they do a phenomenal job and I hate the amount of, you know, aggression that they get. I think that the majority is pretty happy with the game. Um, I will say PVP updates, please. I don't know how to do it because I'm not a PK or I asked Doge and or Doge or whatever and he talked in circles for 10 minutes about how nobody wants to PK because no PK updates and it, I didn't understand it. But give them updates, man. I, I love the mods. I think they're doing a phenomenal job. And yes, I still get pillory guard random events. I get asked that a lot. And also, while we're on topics of questions I get asked constantly, Noah didn't drop the soap. We had individual showers at every prison I went to. Boom. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> wow. That's not, not good, like in actually. our cell, not, not like a personal shower. I mean, it was like four individual showers on the whole block. So it wasn't like you had to go in a group with a bunch of people. You don't have to wait 20 minutes for a shower, but you're not going in there with another man. It's going to be like, you dropped the soap. <laughs> you didn't wash behind your ears. Like the dude said on the boondocks, you ain't wash behind your ears. I was watching. You know, that that didn't happen. Everywhere that I went. Yo, yo I love that episode, showers. man. So funny. That's such a great episode, man. I, I absolutely love that show. Uh, I did find so, out when I was in jail that laughing really loud at the boondocks whenever I was hanging out with my black friends was not recommended. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you dude, what, you're not supposed to think that's funny. 
<laughs> what was like? What was the procedure then when somebody did drop the soap? Like, I, I'm, I'm assuming they didn't actually pick it up, right? Like, well, that's I'm what sure I'm saying is some people, right? No, no, that's what I'm saying is that there were only one man showers. There was never a situation where there was more than one person in the shower. So hypothetically, if you did drop your soap, nobody would even know, bro. Just bend over and pick it up. But I, if I dropped the bar of soap, I'm telling you I right still now, look behind. I still, look I behind. didn't pick it up. But not for that reason. I didn't pick it up because there's a bunch of baby felons all over that shower floor, and I'm not about oh, to. <laughs> yeah. Oh, some, oh, some joints at some prisons they call taking a shower getting laid. So if I drop the bar of soap, it's done. I don't care if it's antibacterial. Yeah, that, if that dude. shit hits that floor, no. It's stained. It's yeah. It's, it's, it's. I'm sorry to the uh, guy that has to clean the showers every night, but bro, I'm not picking that shit. I'm not touching. Oh, that. that's minging, man. It's entered the abyss. <laughs> if you it, like, you have to wear slides in there. That was another thing about adjusting to society. I'm still not fully comfortable with barefoot showers. Ain't that fucking weird? Um, because if you go in there barefoot into a prison shower, your toes are going to be throwing up gang signs in like four hours. Like you're going to get stabbed by a gang because they're going to think that your toes are repping a click. You know what I mean? So definitely, if you ever serve time, wear shower shoes. I have seen some horrific, horrific Vietnam style fucking <laughs> foot fungus. What do they call it? Jungle rot. From dudes that accidentally stepped on the shower floor. But the showers oh, were chill, man. just so everybody knows. The showers were chill. That's just volatile, dude. That's just volatile. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, it ain't about the soap, you know? God damn. Yeah, it's not about the soap. It's about... It's kind of the principle of the matter. I'm not, I'm not getting that bar. So I got another bar of soap in my locker. They're 50 cents. I don't have to risk it, you know, get, get AIDS yeah. or something down there on the floor. I just... They clean the showers every day. I didn't inspect how good of a job that they did, but they would take out the old bars of soap that fell because you go in there and there's four bars of soap. And if you step on one, your ass is grass because you're going to land. You're going to be making sperm angels. I don't know if I can say I don't know if I can say it on YouTube. Sorry. <laughs> no, don't worry. It's over an hour. Oh, YouTube doesn't care anymore. I'm just <laughs> kidding about that, guys. But but for real, though, the, the poor guys would clean up the soap and I just felt horrible for them because it was just grimy in there, Admirable. man. But luckily, there were no group showers. You didn't have to worry about that. And for what it's worth, um, I never saw an instance of like non-consensual assault in prison that I can confirm that was real. It didn't happen in any of the joints that I was at. It does happen in prison, but in none of the places was I at. Was there a confirmed case of somebody getting assaulted in that manner uh, against their will? Yeah, there was plenty of consensual fun. going on, but as far as like assault, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Did you ever get flirted with? No. Um, no, but the gay dudes are real friendly to me. Um, and the thing about it is, listen, I'm not homophobic in the slightest. I've said this on my stream a lot. My mom's married to a woman, bro. She came out of the closet when I was like 12. She wanted kids and, you know, she tried to live a normal life, if you will. I'm not homophobic, bro. I'm cool with gay people. I don't give a fuck. But the thing about it is, man, in prison, it's all about image. If you get seen talking to the gay dudes too much, people are going to start saying that you're having sex with them and then you got to fight them. You know what I mean? And it's just like, so it's just like, I, I, I have to admit it, man. I hate to say it for real. I hate to say it, but I avoided hanging out with the gay guys because there's a stigma attached to it. And I was doing what I had oh, to yeah. do in the, in the atmosphere that I was in. Yeah, so like, no, I always try to be real about prison and how I acted in there. Like how about how I tell you I wasn't gangster and I wasn't tough and trying to fight people and all that shit. And I will also admit that I tried to avoid too many interactions with gay people because of the stigma attached to it. Uh, sorry, mom, you know, but she understands that I was <clears throat> when in Rome, do as the Romans do, because I start hanging out with this gay dude and this dude calls me the B word over here, which is the worst word that you can say in prison. And unfortunately, I'm still brainwashed and I get super triggered when I hear it. So this dude calls me the B word. Now I got to fight him. You get what I'm saying? It's just like, it's just yeah, better to yeah. just not. I'm just going to, you know, I'll be friendly with them. I'll chat with them. If they're selling some food on the rec yard, I'll buy it. But you can't really like rub elbows with them too closely. But no, I didn't get flirted with, but they definitely. Should I even say this? Historically, yes. bro, it's over an hour. It's yeah, good. you can say friend. anything now, dude. It's over an hour. It, it's not like <laughs> offensive, but uh, but like, it's about me. Look, I was raised in a house with a ton of gay people, right? My mom came out of the closet when I was twelve. I'm I'm totally totally one hundred percent comfortable with gay people, just like I am with black people, Asian people, Hispanic people. I don't judge like that. You know what I mean? Gay dudes can sense that I'm one hundred percent comfortable with them, and sometimes they misinterpret that as me, you know, going both ways or whatever. I don't know why I'm talking about this on this fucking podcast. What did y'all do to me, man? This is so <laughs> random, but but it's the truth. And so, I mean, that does that also translates to prison because in prison you're expected to have a hard masculine stance against gay people. You know, you're supposed to use slurs and stuff like that, and like you know, that's the 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 pariahs, the untouchables. You know, and I'm not like that, and they know that. So sometimes they misinterpret it, and they're like, "Oh yeah, you know." And I am very happily married to a gorgeous woman. I wasn't then, but like. Even today, I hang out with gay guys, and a lot of them think that I might be down because just because I'm cool with it, if that makes sense. Like, I don't care if they do it. Um, 
But as far as prison flirting, I don't think that it ever crossed line into that territory. I definitely got some stares. I will not lie. And it's funny because if a convict heard me admit this, they would think that I was just like the weakest punk dude in the world. But I'm just being honest, man. I got some stares, you know, and you just got to shut it down quickly. You know, you got to the fuck you looking at, bro. You just got to shut it down, you know, and it's that simple, man. If somebody tries it, you just have to swing on them. And if you get your ass kicked, everybody's going to say, hey, he went. He did his best, bro. He went. They don't care if you win or lose. I already said that. That's the ultimate jail tip I can give you. Swing your fist. It doesn't matter if they hurt you, bro. That's not what it's about. It's about you not being scared. If they can't take it from you for free, you're good. Just yeah. haul off on them and swing. So, mm. you know, on that, on that kind of subject then, while you were in there, you did six years. Uh, can you tell us about any encounters you had? Like any, obviously... Nobody wants to get into a fight or anyone that's kind of like level minded, right? So, but I'm assuming you you had quite a few. So, could you tell us some incidents where you managed to get yourself into a fight and for what reason? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so there's hot words in prison. You do not, under any circumstances, refer to a man as anything feminine at all. The worst number one no go is bitch. That word, I, I I'm still brainwashed. I can't help it. Like. That word is supposed to be like instant. You know what I mean? And God, I, I hate, sometimes I don't even like talking about it because I don't want people to get the impression that I think I'm tough or I'm trying to be tough. I'm not like that. I'm just telling the truth. Um, so I owed a white crip some money. I have a YouTube video about this because this is like my favorite one, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. I owed a, he's a white guy and he was a crip. He was affiliated with a gang, you know, which is typically associated with being a black gang, but he was certified, verified and accredited. You know what I mean? He was a member of the gang. Um, I got along with him like shit. We didn't really like each other, but I ended up, I don't remember. Maybe he had, I don't think it was drugs, but for some reason I owed him $10 and I was about to go to visitation. My best friend came to visit me at prison this day. And so I'm crisp. I got my, I got my fucking khakis on, you know, ironed up, you know, I'm good to go. Cause you, you, you want to look good when you go to visitation as best as you can in the prison khakis. Um, but I, it was visitation. I went down there to ask his cellmate something and he said something smart to me about his money. And I was like, bro, I told you I got you on Thursday. It's Tuesday. You can't cry on Tuesday. And you're not supposed to say men cry either. Oh, uh, you don't, you don't, you don't say feminine. You don't say, you don't call him a bitch, pussy, ho, slut, skank, you know, none of that, anything that could be associated with being feminine and you damn sure don't accuse him of crying. So I said, you're, you can't cry to me on Tuesday when I owe you on Thursday, bro. You can cry on Thursday if I don't have your money, but I'm going to have your money on Thursday. Like, how are you already harassing me about this? And he said, I'm just saying, bro, it's, it's in your best interest. And you have to, I have, please understand. I'm not an egotistical guy. You have to do certain things. He said, it's in your best interest. If you get me my money on time. And I said, I said something to the effect of like, I'm going to have your money, but not because I'm scared of you. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to have your money because I'm a good businessman, because I want to keep my business honest. You can't talk shit before the, the rent is due. You know, that was my position. And he said, I'm just saying it's best for you. And he went to turn around and leave the cell. And he looked back and he said, you're a pussy dog. And so, voila. So uh, needless uh -huh. to say, I immediately swung on him. I hit him in the ear. He had Carip tattooed in his ear. Gang stuff, you know. He's got a cauliflower yeah. now. It says Cape. Because it said C-A-R-I-P. Uh, <laughs> I split his ear open with a very lucky punch. Not bad. It wasn't a severe split. He's got a little cauliflower ear right there. So he turned around, elbowed me in the jaw. Good. I mean, instantly. I have to. I, I severely underestimated this guy because he was a little out of shape. Uh, so we start bowing up, throwing. And this dude, I will admit that I have not fought many left-handed people when I was in there. Southpaws fuck me up if they're left-handed. And I was not paying attention to his left hand at all. I had my hand up, you know, to... Like if I needed to block my face, but I was looking at his right hand and that left hand fucked my world, bro. He threw one of the hardest punches that I've ever felt in my entire life. My teeth right here cut all the way through my gums, even though my teeth were clenched. Like my teeth, my, my, I almost had a hole right here. I still Ooh. got a mad wad of scar tissue right here. I'm talking about he split my shit, boy. I was seeing stars. He hit me so hard. And uh, so oh, needless yeah. to say, I became instantly disoriented. You know, I got shadow barrage the fuck out. I'm confused. <laughs> What do you do when you start losing a fight or you, or you confused? I grappled him. <laughs> so, so I grabbed him and we took a step back and we fell on the edge of the bunk because you can't fight in a fucking cell the size of a closet. You know, everybody ends up falling to the ground. I fractured my elbow, which I, I fractured many times fighting in prison. I can't get a good angle. Look at that hook. You see that hook on it? That's from going down. Oh, oh yeah, my that's from going down. My other elbow is not like that. See, Damn. that's legitimately from cracking, the, cracking it on the floor a bunch of times because in a small cells, when you grapple and fight, you pretty much have to go down at some point. Uh, oh, so man. we tripped on the edge of the bed. We went down and Rough. he got up before me. And let me tell you, I had, I mean, I had, my mouth was just full of blood, dude. I looked, I looked like a horror show and I'm 10 minutes away from going to visit. Um, no. So, uh, he stands up first, right? And this is where shit gets ugly in prison most of the time. 
because fighting isn't about honor in there. It's about hurting a motherfucker. So at this point, needless to say, he is in every capacity to stomp all of my teeth out of my head. He's got the advantage. He could fuck my life up. He stood up and he said, are you done? I said, man, I'm done. <laughs> and he said, he said, get up. Neither one of us really wanted more, but I would definitely say that he won the fight. I mean, it was, yeah. it was a close one until that left hook. He definitely won, you know? Yeah, so he, yeah. I got up off the ground yeah. and I said, motherfucker, I'm going to visit. I realized I had all this shit. And I was like, man, you punk ass bitch, but it's over now. You know, I'm still talking shit. And he's like, man, but he was acting cool because he was more mature than me. So I went up there and brushed my teeth, man. And everybody's laughing. And I got blood pouring out of my elbow and my mouth and shit. I'm like, I got to go visit with pink teeth right now, man. This is fucking. And, and the COs are going to see me. My shit's swelling up. I don't know if you guys ever punched in the face and got a swell. It swells yeah. up like a grapefruit. Like, I mean, like, it's amazing how much fluid can fit in your cheek right here. And so I'm going to visit, like, hey, what's up, guys? And I go in there, and they, they're all happy to see me. I walk in the door. I'm like, hey. And I smile. My teeth, teeth are all pink. And they're like, Josh. <laughs> Josh, what the fuck? And I'm like, I just got in a fight. Shut the fuck up. Because if the COs find out, you go to the shoe. You get put in solitary confinement if you're fighting. So uh, my shit's all swelled up, swelled up. They were like, the fuck's the matter with you? I said, I got a gum infection, bro. He's like, man, you need to go to medical. I said, I'm good, man. I've had these before. It's just a gum infection, man. I'm swelling up. He said, what happened to your elbow? I was like, man, I hit it playing uh, racquetball or uh, wall ball on the rec yard. That's what she always tell him. You, you got hurt on the rec yard. You were just being rough playing sports, you know, and uh, I made it. I didn't get put under investigation. Boy, I tell you, if I hit this elbow in the right spot now, there's an exposed nerve or something right there. Oh, fuck's sake. Oh, yeah. I jacked my elbow up losing fights. Um, but I have to say that dude was my cellmate three days later and became one of my best friends for the rest of my sentence <laughs> <laughs> i'm dead ass hey. serious bro i'm dead ass serious he's a cool motherfucker and i respected the fact that when he could have fucked me up he didn't you know what i mean that's not a prison style thing that's legitimate internal like that's honor is what that was he did it because yeah, he didn't when want he hit to do you it. he felt the connection you know yeah all of a sudden it's like our you know we did the what's in dragon ball where you like fucking morph together like we yeah. became best friends for real though he became a really good friend of mine and we respected each other you know he respected me because he called me a pussy and i swung on him i respected him because that left hook is a monster and I did not see it coming. And he he took me out of the game. I have to admit it, man. I'm not sitting here trying to brag and act like I did some shit. That boy, that boy messed my world up with that punch. That's the hardest punch I've ever gotten in my life. So that was a little drawn out. But yeah, that was that was a yeah, fight story. Did, did you ever pay him the ten dollars? I'm guessing you right on time. <laughs> right on time, just like I was gonna do, even if we didn't fight. I paid him right on time, right when I got my money. I said, "Here's your flat book, buddy." I gave him a big old fat wad of stamps. I said, "There you go." It was never an issue. I was never yeah. going to be late on it. You know what I mean? Like this, or I was out of nothing. But for some reason, after we duked it out, we didn't have that tension anymore. And I believe that this can be achieved without having to get physical. You can do this just through verbal, you know. Sometimes you got to kind of rage each other out and act like an asshole and figure each other out a little bit. And then you're over it. You know what I mean? It's like verbal hugging it out or fight hugging it out. You know what I mean? It's just after that, we were yeah. cool with each other. We had respect. We had no more problems. We got along good. He was a great cellmate. We cleaned the cell, kept it good. Really good guy. Very honorable. Yo, what's 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 the deal with the stamps, right? So like, you have this, uh, like you know, this this whole almost like an MMO currency thing going on mm -hmm. in the prison, right? Yep. So like, where does it come from? Obviously, probably from like the people that work in the prison, right? Like, but like, the the circulation seems almost black market, right? But Basically, then, but then it, but then you also somehow can you you know use the money to to make certain things, buy certain things, and then like it helps the the actual people in the in the prison yeah there's an actual economy there's a prison economy straight up yeah yeah and mm -hmm. like so so like you know like what what's the what's the system like like how much is being like supplied uh you know fresh from like mm -hmm. the, the people that work in the prison versus the, the jailmates right like because like i'm assuming you, you could have stamps from 10 years ago right Still yes there are many of them other dude right? yeah there's so i'm tons assuming of them they, they could be circulating too, right they, they could be inflation in this and this <laughs> yeah no doubt yes. no 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 brilliant no, no. question yeah. brilliant question because he's right because the prisons that i was at look different prisons have a different value for the stamp the stamp is a hypothetical value just like paper money right the yeah. stamp has a hypothetical like you could hypothetically send a letter with this at one point stamps were 50 cents on the commissary but they're 33 cents from person to person if i got a dollar and give this dude a dollar a honey bun that's a dollar he's going to give me three stamps you know what i mean so there's no stamps coming in at all because why the fuck would you buy them from the commissary? So you got these taped up 32 cent 1986 stamps that have been fucking going around. It's probably worth a hundred thousand dollars going around, <laughs> going around the prison, you know, Vintage. as just basically a currency placeholder. And there was a severe problem with the fact that the stamps were 33 cents because there was a woodworking shop there. You could get access to and learn how to make little jewelry boxes for your family or do leather work and make belts and wallets and send it home to your family, right? You just had to buy the supplies and stuff. It was pretty cool. It wasn't a trade, but it was a hobby, a hobby craft, they call it there. You can study hobby craft or whatever. 
So these guys want to send this thing home and it's going to take 150 stamps. Do you think they're about to buy the stamps off the commissary? No. They're going to go buy books of stamps and find mailers, the ones that still work, because they normally don't, because motherfuckers be putting them in their sock or in their ass crack or they're bundled up under their nuts or they, you know, they took a shower and forgot that it was in their fucking bag or whatever and it got wet. God. Like these stamps are raggedy haggard as fuck. <laughs> and, um, and there was a massive campaign, Rice Cup, to all agree that stamps were now worth 50 cents. Like these dudes went hard <laughs> on it. They were explained, they were making charts. They were explained like the white collar criminals got down on this dude, like the tax evaders and shit, like, that. <laughs> like the accountants and all that, you know, like they were in there like, this is my shit. Let me get in there. And they fucking pulled out paper and they're drawing all these plans and like showed how it would be so much better for the prison economy. They literally said, if we the accepted the stamps would be 50 cents each. And so all of a sudden, all the store men were like, you come at them with four stamps for whatever. And they give you one back, you know, they're like, nah, and it didn't work. It ended up flopping and failing. And they just like went back to the 33 cent. They couldn't get everybody to agree on it even though the math worked out. Convicts typically aren't that good at math unless it comes to like dope dealing for some reason. Uh, they're <laughs> yeah. great at that. They're very charismatic and great with that, you know, but um, no, you're, you're absolutely right, dude. There was an economy and there was an economic fucking crisis where there were no stamps coming in and these dudes would send out 150 stamps to mail this thing home and that's stamps that are gone from the compound forever. There's a stamp shortage now, you know what I mean? So it was a really good question in my opinion, man. Yeah, that happens. And then you got guys that when you get a letter, um, they put deodorant on the stamp on their letter because you know they stamp it at the post office. Put deodorant on it, roll on deodorant, rub it with a napkin, put a little bit of uh, Vaseline on it, rub it a little bit, and that shit will come off. And then they fake it, which is hypothetically not supposed to happen. They'll peel it off, stick it to a piece of wax paper, and ta da, look, I have a functioning stamp now. So very few coming in because most of the time, if you tried to remove it from a letter and pass it off as a fake, it wouldn't work. Um, if you handed a guy some stamps to pay for something and one of them was marked by the post office, he'd give it back. That counted. That was void currency because it voids the hypothetical value of being able to send a letter with it. You get what I'm saying? So, yeah, man, it was an economic crisis. You're absolutely right. Just like an MMO. You know, there's nothing coming Except in and all these stamps the going out and the money's disappearing. Yeah. And so now we're gonna having to use mackerel packs because they're exactly a dollar or honey buns because they're exactly a dollar. And now when you want to pay your bills, you come back from commissary with three bags, slam full of shit and everybody on the compound staring at you like, I'm about to go get me some of that. Yo, what's the most stamps you've had at one time in your life? <laughs> All right. At one point, I had about $450, $500 worth of stamps. Damn, I, bro, what was the plan? You know, what was like the master <clears throat> plan? I mean, guys, I've been pretty open and honest this whole time, so I'm not going to stop now, bro. Uh, <laughs> mostly for bills for drugs, straight up. <laughs> I'm being honest with you, man. Were these uh, the early I did a lot years? Of drugs the first time. Were they yeah. the early years? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, the and second time that I went back, I got involved in some nonsense again. And uh, it wasn't drugs. It pertained to a cell phone and some trouble happened and nasty shit went down. And I ended up having about $500 worth of stamps that time as well uh, in a tube sock and passed it straight off to a dude covert. No idea what he did with it. Cause if you get caught with that many stamps, you're going to the shoe and they're taking them all away and throwing them in the trash. Well, Oof. well, they don't man. throw them away and they, they say they throw them in the trash, but they typically go to snitches to be honest with you. But uh, oh, okay. Yeah, of course they got to, yeah, you know, they, they grease right, up the snitches you know. is what they do. Yeah. They'll uh, act like they're doing a shakedown in a, in a snitches cell and leave like $100 worth of stamps in there if they give them good information. And now all of a sudden, this dude's running around balling. Um, but yeah, there were times where I had, that's a significant amount by prison standards. That's a very significant amount of stamps and money to have. Yeah. And it was very difficult to obtain that many. Uh, the, when you get that many stamps, the guy that you're getting it from, you would never expect. You know what I'm saying? He, <laughs> he's gangster. He's doing it right. Like, they're like, look, I got to do this and this and this. Sly. And when they find out you're serious about your money, you know, they find out like, like, no, for real, I'm trying to drop 500 and I need the stamps. Who do I send it to? You know, I got street contacts. I can do this. It's a very covert thing because it's all against the law and the rules. And um, they'll be like, all right, listen, 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 listen. They go talk to the guy that just sits there and watches TV all day and doesn't talk to anybody. You know, and that's the dude that little do we know, everybody's working for him and he's got his whole mattress is full of stamps. And like, he's, he's a fucking sending 20 grand home a month and shit, like big ball and crazy dog, you know? And you'd never expect it. So it was very difficult for me to obtain that many stamps. But at the end of the day, I handled my business. I paid my bills. I got out of the situation that I was in because I got in over my head and drug debt. And uh, my family fucking helped me out for no reason. Uh, I guess just because they love me. And they believed that one day I would be here. And now I am. So thank you, family. Thank yeah. you, everybody who supported me. <clears throat> oh, yeah. So when it, when it comes to currencies in prison, like uh, we were talking earlier about these um, immigrants who were working in prison because they could make good money um, and they actually get paid real USD. So mm -hmm. how does that process work? Like I'm assuming they don't just get given that money in prison. It goes into like an account or something. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you have a, your books is what they're called. 
They are no longer tangible books, needless to say, but the phrase is a throwback. Uh, you have computers in the feds, and you can access them with your PIN number and your uh, passcode, which mine was 1635249. Ooh, I still my fingers went right to it. Um, and you can check how much money you have. If you have an official prison job, yes, your money goes straight to that as an electronic money on a screen. No tangible anything. They have a form called a BP something or other where you can print off a check from your account, go to the library, you get your counselor to sign off on it, and you mail it away. Um, alternatively, they took this away now because I don't know why they thought this was a good idea. Feds had MoneyGram for three years where you could take the money on your account and you could send $100 a day to any email that accepted your fucking email address. Like you had to do the convict email because we did have an email system and they're very, very limited. Uh, it's very staggered. They hold your emails for 20 minutes and then send them all out at once. You know what I mean? Like it's, but it's useful. It's handy. And once somebody has to accept your inmate link email and agree to receive emails from this inmate and use this program, if they accepted it, you could send them $100 a day. So needless to say, lots more people are in prison now than were before because <laughs> instead of having to call my people on the streets and be all sneaky about this shit, I go to this guy and I'm like, yo, what's your, uh, what's your girl's email? You know? And he's like, I got you. Come on. You know, and we talk it out. She accepts my email. I send her a hundred dollars. The next day I send her. I specifically remember one time uh, when you buy in bulk, you get bonus obviously. Right. I mean, we know how this shit works. Um, I remember one time I had $400 and I was paying my month, my weekly or bi-monthly bills. Everything in there is on a loan system. If you're not willing to front your stuff out and get paid for it later, you will not make money because people don't have it in hand. Typically, you know what I mean? You got to wait till payday. That's your bills day. So, um, I was getting close to bills day and I had $400 on my account. Thank, thank God for my amazing family, dude. They supported me even when I was a piece of shit and I love them to death. And I'm so glad that I'm here making up for all of the bullshit that I put them through now and being the person that they gave me this money to become because I'm alive. Um, yeah, I had $400. So I was going to get $500 worth of stamps for that, um, which is going to take four days to send the money around. There's a limit, $100 a day. So I went to him and I was like, listen, we're going to do this and this and this. So I sent him the hundred and he only gave me a hundred dollars worth of stamps. And I was like, can I not get like the, a quarter of the bonus stamps? And he said, no, when you send the last one, I'll give you all the bonus because we don't know what could happen. I could go to the hole. You could go to the hole. Like anything could happen. You know what I mean? Like, so I'm just oh. going to give you the, I'm going to give you the standard $100 worth of stamps until the last payment. Then I'm gonna give you the bomb. So then I got nervous. And in prison, if somebody's in a gang and they try to rip you off, you have to end up going to a group of people and trying to get them to talk to their gang leader, their shot caller. And it can get ugly. And I'm over here like, fuck's sake, I'm gonna have to go to the shot callers and shit. This dude's trying to rip me off. The fourth day that I sent the money, he gave me an extra $50. He gave me 150 extra dollars and said, keep your business with me. I got the stamps. Whenever you need them, <laughs> spend that money with me. Because dudes, when, when dudes see that you're about the business, they want to fuck with you, you know? So I will say that I'm proud to say that I did handle my business in there. And when I fucked up, I made up for it. Even if I had to be a piece of shit and beg my family and admit to all kinds of terrible things, they got me through it, man. You know? And I don't recommend doing drugs or gambling if you go to prison, guys. Don't, don't fucking get involved in it. Now, um, you were talking about Stitches, or sorry, snitches. Snitches <laughs> get stitches. Same thing. <laughs> stitches. <laughs> I was wondering, man, do you have any good snitch stories? Other than the fact that I got snitched on, not that I can think of off the top of my head. I missed a lot of stuff. A lot of times people would be like, yo, they saw a fucking Counselor Rob put stamps in, in uh, Handboy's locker. Everybody's got dumb nicknames in prison. They, they, they saw him put stamps in Handboy's locker, bro. He's a snitch. And then they just run over there and just kick the fuck out of him. You know, like four <laughs> dudes just run down on him because there's no other reason. But, um, I got snitched on, um, and it actually is part of the reason that I got so much extra time, uh, probably. So there was, I was in county jail. I was 19, obviously. I had a public defender. I couldn't afford an attorney, man. I lived in abject poverty growing up. My mom's a nurse now, and everything's good, and I'm a Twitch streamer. Like We're all solid now, but it was hard times back then. I didn't have an attorney. Uh, but the public defenders are defending half the jail. They're the attorneys for everyone. Well, uh, one day, my attorney sent me a motion to not be my lawyer anymore by conflict of interest. And I'm like, the fuck happened? It turns out that a pedophile, a pedophile in my county jail heard me rapping. I used to like rap. I listened to a lot of Eminem growing up and I wrote a lot of really nasty, violent rap lyrics and I loved it. And it was a really good outlet for me. And it was very Eminem style, old school, you know, violent graphic, not good to write these kind of things when you're awaiting charges on threats. So anyways, he heard that I was writing down these raps in a notebook and the, and the, the guys in the jail thought it was cool that I rapped. They thought I was good at it. And they'd be like, hey, man, listen, I'm going to give you a Snickers bar and you hit that rap you wrote for my friend Mikey that just got here. He's got to hear this shit. So they give me a Snickers, you know, and I rap. This pedophile over here is it. He's my notebook. 
goes to his attorneys. I have information on Josh Palat suggesting that he was truly going to carry out his threat because he saw me on the fucking news. They had to file a conflict of interest because they hired him because he had him first. Hire me a new attorney that sold me up the motherfucking river and gave a 50% time cut to a pedophile Aww. because they came in there and took away some notebooks where I drew doodles and, and raps and they put them all up on the screen, twisted them out of their original meaning, misquoted them with the wrong words and used it as evidence of a maniac because it did look like a straight serial killer's maniac. I got copies around here somewhere. But I mean, I was sitting in a cell all day with nothing but a pad and a piece of, and a pen. You know, I filled up like three yeah. notebooks, just drawing and writing songs and drawing guitar diagrams so I could start trying to learn music theory. I thought I knew it back then. I was so cute, noob. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that's the biggest snitch story that I've got. They had to move him. They moved him out of our pod, first off, because somebody found out that he was a mo. And so they immediately, instead of smashing him, uh, I was in a pod with a lot of old guys at this point in time. <laughs> it was like old, angry white guys, mostly white collar crimes. And then like me. And then like a bunch of like 18, 19 year old black dudes that were in there for like selling weed. So you can see who I was hanging out with. I was hanging out with the black guys and I was doing all this rap and stuff and showing them, you know, and uh, they ended up snitching and uh, like kicking the snitch out. Somebody said that dude's a chomo. I called my mom. She looked him up. He's a fucking chomo. They kicked him out of the pod. Two days later, I find out he snitched on me. Three days after that, I went to booking for some reason. I think I had to see the nurse. You know, they'll put you in the booking cell in the front of the jail instead of in like the actual population. And uh, I saw his ass come out and I was like, you big. I'm not even going to say what I said. <laughs> on YouTube, but I did see him and I called him out in front of God and everybody in front of about 30 inmates. I called him out and you did, you man, you snitched on me. You got in the time cut and he's like, what, what are you talking about? I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, bro. What do you mean, bro? And I was like, bro, I'm not your fucking bro, bro. <laughs> I was an idiot when I was younger, man. I hate how egotistical I was, but this pissed me off though. This was for real though. This yeah, dude snitched on me, man. Yeah. They ran in on my cell so hard. I ended up, uh, the time that they ran in because of this guy's tip, I was in a solo cell, individual near booking, right? Uh, I can't remember why. Oh, I beat up this old guy, Ronnie Beard. That's a story for another day. Uh, I don't take pride in beating up old people. He asked for it. He called me the B word. Um, so I was in booking and I'm asleep. And this is how the cops work pretty much all the time. The CO popped my cell, which means open my cage remotely, you know, and he goes, hey, Paul, you want to go to the library? I was like, nah, man, I'm good. I'm, I'm taking a nap. I'm good. And he said, come on, man. You need to go to the rec yard, get you some sunshine, go to the library, get you a book or something, man. You can't just lay in here all day. And I was like, I'm good, man. He said, come on, man, get up. You're going to the rec yard. So I was like, ah, fuck, man. All right. That's shit. I mean, I guess if it's forced, you know, there might be some legal thing I don't know about. I don't know. So I get up, I put my shoes on. And the second that I stepped out of that cell, two cops grabbed my shirt, puts me up against the wall. And three more of them ran into my cell and just started destroying everything, cutting my mattress open fucking unbolting the toilet, ripping pa pages out of books. Like, I mean, just like, it didn't even look like they were looking for anything. It looked like they were just trying to sow discord. So they took away all my notebooks. I didn't know what they took. I, I, I was like, they can search my cell. They stick me in the library. I'm like, I don't give a fuck. That was so unnecessary. He could have just been like, come on, you got to shake down. But no, they had to go all motherfucking. I feel like I'm important mode on me. So they put me in the, uh, they put me in the library. And uh, when I come back down, I'm like, I didn't have nothing. Then I realized my notebooks were gone. And I was like, oh, fuck. That was oh, stupid of me. Shit. That was stupid. I was like, I need to call my attorney. So they let me out for a lawyer call. And I'm like, I did something dumb. And he's like, what did you do? And I said, they just took away some notebooks and I wrote some graphic things in them. Uh, obviously cartoonish, clearly not true. One of the lines involves making a corpse into a coffee table. So, I mean, it's not like I'm being serious God. here. Um, but, oh my God. No, dude. No, I, I went hard because I was very aggravated and I felt very, at this point in time, I felt like I did nothing wrong. This the, the, the stage that I'm at now was not how I was then. You know what I mean? This was a gradual learning process for me. At that time, I'm over here like, yo, fuck this shit. Fuck pigs. I didn't do nothing wrong. Free Josh. You know, I'm running around acting like an idiot. And so I was writing these raps. And in these raps, I was sarcastically making fun of the FBI calling me a school shooter. That was not a good idea. Lots of school shooter references in the in the in the songs because it was just my outlet for it, man. I was just making humor about it. And and it went badly. That's how I got my first mental evaluation. <laughs> <laughs> they oh ended God. up filing a motion for a mental evaluation which i had to do and of course he said he is not a danger to society he's not a threat to himself or to other people so i do not find him to be in the range i did a dangerous assessment the fbi didn't like that so they immediately requested another one they said no we want a bigger one send him away to a real prison where he can get a real mental evaluation and i ended up going to butner north carolina for fucking 90 days where bernie madoff is or was rest in peace i guess and um having a 90-day mental evaluation Full on grueling IQ test, puzzle test, reading and comprehension test, like competency, everything you can imagine. It was grueling. It was grueling, man. I mean, they like untangled my brain. You know what I mean? She came up with the same thing. Not a danger to society. Judge didn't want to hear it. They subpoenaed her to try and trick her, make her slip up and say something bad. 
And she gave a beautiful testimony, man. And I really respect the doctor that uh, gave me my middle evaluation because everything she said about me was positive. She said he helped the other inmates on the floor. There, there is actually illiteracy in prison, guys. I didn't know that that still exists. There's legitimately people in there who cannot read. And they didn't have any money for the phone, but the email is five cents a minute. And I would sit down and I would type these emails for these guys. You know, they can't, they can't fucking read, but they want to talk to their family. So I helped them set up the email and all that stuff. And uh, she told about that on the stand. I didn't even know that she was observing me at that time. You know what I mean? I was just, I was on the block and I was just trying to help. And the judge didn't want to hear it, man. That judge hated my guts. He slammed the gavel so hard when he sent it to me that the probation officer came to my lawyer and said, I'm not even going to go talk to him right now. I've never seen him like this before. And I'll make sure the other charge gets dropped, but I'm not going to go talk to him right now. He's mad. Yo, dude. Have you ever considered maybe he was the guy that you uh, you spoke to in RuneScape? <laughs> maybe, maybe he was the dude. <laughs> no. Hey, people say that all the time. They're like, you found him, bro. He won. <laughs> that was him. That was the guy. <laughs> Holy shit, you're busted. I do actually have the first and last name of the guy that reported me, believe it or not. Oh, did I even mention that guy? Yeah, he reported yeah, he me, did. but he didn't just report me. He called the cops. Did I mention that? He, uh, one of the lines no, that no, I said, didn't one of the oh, lines no, that I no. said, this, this story is so big that it's really hard for me to like, I don't want anybody to think I'm intentionally trying to leave out dark parts or anything. But um, I did say, look for the last name Palalt on the news, April 20th, 2013, LOL, right? So it transpires that this day was a Saturday. FBI didn't care. Uh, it didn't matter that my little brother went to the school. They didn't care. Uh, it didn't matter that all the teachers that worked there wrote character reference letters for me. It didn't fucking matter. Anyways, he typed my last name in on Google. Every Palalt at that time lived in Oxford, Mississippi. He called the Oxford Police Department. They contacted the FBI. They got two calls almost at the same time, one from Jagex and one from him uh, regarding the threats, which hypothetically, if the day wasn't a Saturday, would have been six months away. But they still sent cops to the football game that night. And they tried to give me a two-point increase because they sent cops to that football game. They tried to give me more time for that. <laughs> oh, oh man. Like they really wanted you by the sound. Like, it does sound like they wanted to make an example out of you. Yep. Honestly, I was, like I was the rune scapegoat. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, that's crazy. It, it's a very unique story because, like, aside from you, I've not heard of anybody. Like, it, unless it's some real shit, like there is actually some plotting behind it and like some mm -hmm. hard real life evidence. Like, I, I've never heard of this kind of stuff happening. Um, it's crazy. I, I think they probably did want to make you into uh, an example, maybe. That's what it was, man. And, um, th th the funny thing is, though, it's like, hearing this story, it's like, as soon as I heard about it, I was like, man, like people need to be careful with what they say online and stuff like that. But There's it's like, line. that's not the case. Like <laughs> the Nobody else getting in any fucking trouble on that, right? Exactly. The, the best part is that I've said way worse than that on RuneScape, man. I started playing in 2004. I've seen worse, and I've Dude. said worse. I, I can tell you right now, guys, can you imagine if this podcast was sponsored by a VPN? And we could be like, this is exactly why you need ExpressVPN. <laughs> hey, I, <laughs> hey, I don't know. I don't know if you guys know who Wavy Websurf is. I don't know if y'all watch him. He does like, you know, historical videos on YouTube and stuff. He should be hitting a million soon. I was talking to him about how uh, he said that the best the best sponsor for my interview would be if, if we did a, if he did a video on me, the best sponsor would be a VPN like. You know what would have protected Josh Palau's identity? It absolutely would not have because Jagex had my information and all that shit, but still, it's great. You know what I mean? Yeah. Jagex handed over my IP address to the FBI uh, when they contacted them. And um, I would just like to reiterate that Jagex is not happy with what happened at all. They had nothing to do with the prosecution in the prison, and I fully support and appreciate the fact that if a threat comes... I would rather serve six years in prison for my dumb ass than them not report a threat and somebody goes and does it. You get what I'm saying? I yeah. tweeted that the other day. That's how I met Zezima because I think Zezima liked that tweet and followed me after that. And uh, it's the truth, man. At the end of the day, they have to report threats, man. If it seems credible, there's, it's just not worth the risk, especially in America. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Especially you know, here in America. I, do you know what? I think um, to, to end this podcast on, maybe we could go back to like your positive times in prison because mm -hmm. uh, to me, it sounded like when you found Buddhism, uh, you were also high at the time. Um, that was kind of like the moment where you reached enlightenment and you, you kind of realized like, Hey, I need to do something with my life a little differently here. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously you don't do drugs anymore. You've been off it for a good amount of time now. Well, um, two years, two years. That's really good. Um, do, would you say like, here, here's an interesting question. Do you think that 
both of those things, the drugs you were on and also Buddhism together, is what made you kind of like realize your ways? Or do you think you would have got there with just one or the other either way? Interesting question. I, I respect that question right there. Um, to be perfectly honest, uh, I think that I would have magnetized to it anyways. It would be too long of a backstory for me to get into, but as a drug abuser, one time I hit ego death on acid. Um, I don't, it basically is where you realize that you're like just vibrating particles in an infinite universe and that like it's all dust and it's not depressing in any way. It's incredible, but it will fuck your mind up. And I was, I was mentally fucked up after that acid trip for days, right? I, I'm not going to go too much into it, but I had this epiphany about how one equals two, duality is singularity. Hot and cold are opposites, but they're the same thing. They're just temperatures. Opposites must exist for something to exist. So you've got like land and space, and then you've got like, you know, hot and cold or light and dark. One has to exist for the other. So therefore, they're really the same thing on opposite ends of the spectrum, which means two equals one, everything. It's impossible for me to explain. And no, it makes sense. you realize that you are fucking nothing, dude. Like all you are is just like a continuation. And it's not depressing. It's not bad. So I had this ego death. I called it my bad trip for years, right? I was like, dude, after that bad trip, after that bad trip, my mind, man, my, my, my bad trip. In Buddhism, what happened to me happens after 30 years of meditation. It is the ultimate goal to have that realization and that epiphany and to change your life through ego death. They call it seeing emptiness. On acid trips, it's called ego death. And I realized that there was, and I tell you, I was obsessed with this thought, this duality concept for days, right? And when I found this book, everything that had happened to me was their law and their teaching. And, and it was laid out exactly what I meant. And nobody that I ever talked to understood what I meant when I was like, I can explain to you how two equals one, not mathematically, of course, that doesn't make any <laughs> fucking sense. But like the, the way that hot, hot and cold, they're opposites, but they're just temperatures. It's the same thing on other ends of the spectrum. So hot and cold are basically the same thing if you look at them as temperatures. And so Buddhism is all about that. It's all about the yin yang, man. Balance. You know, you find balance, you take both sides. I'm all about that. That's why I said I don't PK, but give PKers updates and quit arguing, motherfuckers. Um, and so, yes, absolutely. For the first time in my life, I found something spiritually that I knew for a fact had some basis and some logic. I have since had a spiritual experience. I don't talk about it very much. I'm not a practicing Buddhist anymore. You can see it on my neck. I had something crazy happen to me that I don't even get into because when I, I was an atheist Buddhist for six years, almost 10 years, honestly, I was a Buddhist for, the, for about six. Um, and it changed my life to the point where I am today. So I'm no longer a practicing Buddhist, but I definitely would recommend it to people that are like atheists or trying to get into spirituality. It really gave me a lot of peace. I don't know that the epiphany would have happened that way. Was I not high and happened to be reading that book? I'll, I'll never know for sure. I guess I definitely think the drugs contributed to it. Um, in my opinion, but I do believe that I would have magnetized towards Buddhism. It was right up my alley, man. It was all about you know, I mean, it says like every stranger that you meet, treat them like they're your mother because they might be as far as reincarnation goes and stuff like that. And I have a different spiritual view now because something amazing happened to me to change my life. And now I am where I am today, uh, something I didn't believe in and something I did not want. But that first one was the bridge to the second one. And it was extremely important. And I hope that no matter what happened, that it would have happened to me because it was that was the turning point for sure, man. And I would like to just tell everybody, guys, life fucking sucks sometimes that yin yang I'm talking about. You can't have joy and happiness and peace without a little bit of turmoil and struggle and pain. Embrace it, get through it. And when you get on the other side of it, you're going to be so much better. You're going to be stronger emotionally, stronger mentally, more prepared, better adapted, and you will survive and you will thrive, man. You can get through anything, guys. I promise you. I went through six years of sitting in a cell where I thought the whole world forgot about me for some dumb shit that I was never going to do, man. I got, I got innocent tattooed with a staple on my rib cage. Oh, All right, shit. I'm, get, I'm getting this covered up. I'm married now. I'm getting that, that covered up. But that was done with a staple, guys. I was committed to this fuck the Fed shit and I, poor me shit. I'm over it, man. You can fix it. I promise, guys. We can we can fix it. You can fix it, man. I don't care where you are in life. Bottom of the barrel. I was at the bottom and now I'm at the middle, guys. Come on. <laughs> we yeah. got this shit, guys. You can get through it. I promise. I'm all about that positivity and that overcoming and also working together. Working together, guys. I'm really big emphasis on seeing the other side. Try to picture it from other people's points of view or else you will lose compassion. And when you lose compassion, you lose humanity and shit gets ugly. So love and positivity for all yeah, people, guys. Words. I agree. Love yeah. and positivity. I agree. It's really good, man. Yeah. I, Minty, I, think yeah, I would like to right. say real quick that I'm a big fan of Minty and I hate that you don't feel good, man. And I'm sorry that if I just like hogged the whole podcast because nah, I'm a fan of yours. Then. I sick. was hoping you would, man. I can't <laughs> talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, good. I didn't know it was that severe. Okay, good. Yeah, right, he's well, had I just wanted to point days. out that I'm a big fan and I was never trying to like 
cock block you with the conversation or anything. You know what I mean? I love this whole podcast, dude. I love your energy. I love your mission, your statement. Um, your Thanks, story. man. Fuck, man. It's, it's, it's been a great. Two Sadly, I speak from experience. Yeah. Ooh, we got a good one in there. That was a chunk. Yes, yeah, yeah, sir. I mean, I know you guys I do some long ones, talk. but that was a I just chunk. knew I just let you talk, you know? <laughs> I appreciate you inviting me on here, Rice Cup, man. I appreciate yeah, it. No like problem. I said, I've known all three of you guys for a long time, and it's an honor, you know, that you guys know me now and that I can call you guys friends. It's, it's a fucking honor. Rakesy, a couple months ago when that Pokemon card channel guy quit YouTube, you commented on it, and I was like, yo, old school RuneScape gang in it. You probably never saw it, but... Oh, oh, what's his name? Yeah, I know exactly. It was something about Pokemon cards, and he said, I'm quitting Prime, YouTube. Primetime Pokemon. That's it, yeah, Prime he quit Pokemon. YouTube. Yeah. I was watching the video, and I'm a, I'm a comment burglar, so I was all up in it. I don't know if you guys have ever looked at Behemoth's comments, but I'd be in there shitting on people. If they're, they'd be complaining <laughs> about the streamers and streamers, and be here, you're so cringe. I'm like, why don't you do it? Like, I, I can't stand that negativity, and I will say that that's part of my yin-yang, is that I will dispense negativity to dispel it or make them to see it in a different way. It's not always the best way to handle it. Love cannot i mean hate cannot drive away hate darkness cannot drive away darkness only light and love can do that as martin luther king said but i do be getting salty at those guys um so i saw in the comments i saw in the comments that uh you had you know uh commented like oh man this sucks rest in peace and i was like fucking rakesy that's sick oh yeah man. i'm a fan that's, of his eight months later awesome, a year bro. later <laughs> here we are chatting. and obviously i've kept up with mint mad cow remember when you're doing that pk thing where you're staying in the wilderness i don't remember the exact rules uh i actually had you on my second monitor at that point in time watch the youtube series and rice cut with the legendary one man raids phenomenal content creators here guys if you guys aren't subscribed subscribe to their individual channels you're fucking up that's all i can tell you you'll Thank have you no balance sure. in your life go the, go the way a, of konar balance subscribe to all down plug, bro yo <laughs> hey subscribe listen, to I'm, all four <laughs> josh i, I have a question well. man uh -huh. dude listen we're, we're gonna link all of your stuff down below okay Thank everything you. everything mate it's been an absolute pleasure having you on uh i honestly i've loved this podcast we've barely spoken about runescape and it's just flown <laughs> by okay. so now this is it, about runescape also, to be honest a runescape player that got sent into a deep end you know who doesn't want to know life wilderness that? i mean you so know? you know there it is next time boys you guys are pissed off in the wildy or somebody's taking your bandos room just remember you might end up in prison if you say the wrong things. So. <laughs> There's a line. There's Take a line, guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah, go go smooth on them, boys. Don't don't go to the feds. It's not fun. I promise. <laughs> not everybody would end up like me, and that's why I always tell people I'm glad I was the example. Because some people, I'm not saying I'm necessarily stronger than the next guy, but I did make it and I came out better, and that wouldn't have happened to every you, person. I'd so. say you were exceptional. You know, dude. No, 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 no. I'm a regular ass dude, but luckily I had a drug history, which made me street smart enough to make it through prison and. I'm glad it was me and not somebody else that would have not known how it works and gotten stabbed or something, you know? No, yeah, dude, a hundred percent, man. I, I I can honestly say it seems like you've came out the other side cleaner. You know, you've came out. I I would say obviously I didn't know you before, but I heard the stuff that you did. It, you seem like you've came out a better person, man, and I think that's great. Sure. I really do, and I think that's a real rare thing to happen nowadays. So sadly, and, it like, is. The, the other thing is, as we spoke about during the podcast, it's something which isn't handed to you in prison it's something mm -hmm. that you found yourself and yeah, I, I think like, it should be given to you though mm -hmm. you know but, but there yeah. should be I some mean, help but there at the should end of the be day, right help. now there really isn't and i promise you guys that self-improvement is always possible and that is a buddhist concept that i still hold even though i'm not a buddhist is that constant improvement when you think you're perfect you will cease to improve so yeah, keep improving yeah. guys we can all get better we can all strive to better heights and if you're at the bottom right now guys i promise you can crawl out of it sometimes you got to spelunk you know spelunking Sometimes you got to crawl all the way down before yeah. you can turn around and come back up. You, you got to hit saying? your bottom. I exactly. mean, man, how, hey, how can you appreciate the top until you've been to the bottom, you know? See, you get it. Exactly. We <laughs> haven't reached the top, yo. You know, Dude, like, yeah. that, like for fine. me, like for me, it's like everything that I ever did that was good in my life came from a really dark place. And it came from being at that rock bottom. To be able to be at that rock bottom and be like, wow, this is fucked. Yep. So, like, it, it gave me the most insane, like, I, I don't know if I'd say epiphany, but, like, of just, like, this is fucked. This is what I want to do. And by reaching that bottom, it was like, this is my way out. Yep. And that's what I'm going to work towards. Look so at I, your goal. I, I really work it backwards. That. Start. Absolutely, man. It's beautiful. I really right, appreciate boys. you guys having me on the podcast, man. It's been an absolute great time. If you ever want to yeah. do a reround, I've been on official three times. I can yap all day, boys. So yeah, if you ever if you ever this. short on a guest, hit me up on uh, Twitter. Yo, how about this? We asked oh, yeah. the chat 
you know, uh, if they have any questions for you, because if we ever do a round two, then it'd be nice to have some a section of, for that, you know? Yeah, for sure. And uh, yeah. also, I'd like to point out that there's going to be people in the chat that are like, I'm so tired of Josh. Everybody knows this story. Crumb did it. Moat Plox did it. Silent Core did it. I'm so sick of this. So uh, in response to those guys, uh, fuck you. I love you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just appreciate the podcast. This is content. We're shooting yeah, the shit no, about real stuff. Yeah, no, this is our take on it, all right? Yeah, okay. we're just shooting the breeze about real stuff, guys. But uh, mm -hmm. in my yeah, opinion, I'm a pretty personal guy. Too, if you want. You Come know, hang out. I Twitch stream all the time. They said they're going to put the links below. It's going to be dope. I stream over there on Twitch, that Chapel Alt and all that. And I got a YouTube that I barely ever upload to because I'm busy all the time. But I'm yeah, about to get back to work on Twitch. it. He's pretty active on Twitch. He's pretty active on Twitch. Five days a week, streaming on Twitch, trying to get a Bando's Hilt on my Iron Man, almost 900 KC. Fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> melee every kill <laughs> all melee one to two Yo, kill that's, trips that's the real method you know that's blade a sail door method. and a justy helm going in there fucking hard so <laughs> <laughs> so come watch me get the hilt everybody hopefully by the yeah, time yeah. you come i'm either mm -hmm. done with chambers or i go to court same energy same energy As oh, yeah. like this energy all the way on. static all the time it's been a pleasure <laughs> guys man you guys are legendary and i really love your content and and mint like i said uh, I hate that m the way the players like me are so <laughs> aggressive towards you, but just keep killing them. Maybe they'll get over it. Fuck it. Well, I'm <laughs> not going to stop. Good, man. Get out there and hunt. Cause it's part of the game. And if you're having fun with it, then you deserve to play just as much as I do, man. It's our game. And I hope that everybody keeps playing, quits bitching. I'm glad we have this game. We don't have to play RS3. No offense, Rakesy. We have it. So quit complaining, guys. I'm just glad that we have it. All right, that's pretty much all I got to say. Go easy on the mods, man. Their bosses are about are the ones that are stopping the duel arena and all that shit. Leave them alone, guys. Come on. All righty. <laughs> Be positive. Right. Time for I will cut it there.